think the city's website as noted on the agenda. So, uh, Val um, Council Member Arkin, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Sure. Everybody, please stand. Hand over heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Anyways, and Council Member Arkin, do you have some remarks for the public today? I do, thank you, Mayor Brown. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Pleasanton City Council meeting. Before we get started, I'd like to share some upcoming events and activities that may be of interest to our residents. The Pleasanton Library reopens for indoor services. The Pleasanton Library has reopened grab and go services and launched its first ever take home laptop lending service today. Library patrons can now browse and check out library materials indoors at limited capacity. For more information on indoor hours or to borrow a library laptop, please visit pleasantandlibrary.org. The EDCE webinar. Don't forget, East Bay Community Energy will be hosting a Pleasanton Community Zoom webinar tomorrow, Wednesday, March 17th at noon. EBCE representatives will be available to answer questions you have about their service rollout in April for Pleasanton. Zoom link available via Facebook and at ebce.org. Climate Action Plan 2.0 workshop. Share your feedback and input as we update Pleasanton's Climate Action Plan 2.0 on March 25th at the virtual community workshop from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Register on the city's webpage. Those are my opening comments. Very nice, thank you. I will now ask the clerk for a roll call. Council members Arkin. Here. Balch. Present. Naram. Here. Testa. Here. Mayor Brown. Here. Could I ask the city attorney for a report out of our closed session that happened earlier today at 6 p.m.? Mayor, there's no reportable action from closed session this evening. Thanks. Now we're looking for agenda amendments. Are there anybody agenda amendments from the city council? Seeing none, any agenda amendments from city staff? Yes, Mayor. Uh, item one, your listed February 2nd, 2021 minutes uh, will be continued to your next regular meeting for further edit. February 2nd, and that is it. All right. Um, Items listed on the consent calendar are considered routine in nature and will be enacted by one motion of the council. If discussion is required, the item will be removed from the consent calendar and considered separately. Madam Clerk, have there been any requests to speak on any items on the consent calendar? No, there have not been any speakers. We're in a virtual setting. I will ask my colleagues individually if they have any questions. Uh, Council Member Arkin? Um, yes, I do actually. On item number six, I just have a uh, brief question on, and this is on um, the approving an agreement for auditing services. So I'd just like to um, ask city staff and possibly also the auditing committee if they can comment as well about um, you know briefly describing the reasons for picking this firm over the other bids that were received. And uh, yeah, just a brief comment on that. Staff like to respond. My apologies, I was uh, fussing with the mute button. Um, uh, we got uh, approximately um, six proposals for auditing services. We are required by law to evaluate uh, auditing services every five years. Um, and uh, uh, in this case, we solicited proposals 
conducted extensive interviews and evaluated uh, their proposals uh, and provided recommendations uh, to the audit committee uh, for um, further discussion. Uh, from, a, from a staff perspective, uh, our conclusion was partially based on price, uh, but with these kinds of things, price is not the only determining factor. Uh, we evaluated um, uh, comparable experience with uh, like municipalities uh, with, with the same kind of complex uh, financial um, uh, environments. We checked references, we conducted extensive interviews, um, uh, and then assessed the quality of their staff. And so the proposal that's before you is uh, with the recommended auditing firm for five years, LSL, uh, for the stated uh, contractual prices that are listed uh, in the report. Approximately first year, $70,000 and escalating uh, over the coming five years to 76,000 per year. <clears throat> um, while we would have liked to have kept Mason Associates, our existing um, auditor, um, really governmental accounting principles really encourage that we rotate auditors to make sure that the integrity of the process is adhered to and maintained. Uh, I'll stop there and um, uh, offer Jack and uh, Councilmember Balch and Councilmember Naram for additional comment. Well, I, I don't really, sorry. I don't really have much more to add other than uh, Councilmember Balch and I, um, Grilled might be a little strong of a word, but spent a good 30 minutes uh, questioning uh, our director of finance and satisfying ourselves that this, in fact, was a good fit. I think one of the questions I certainly had was that um, with Mays and Associates, the staff that interacted with the audit committee, um, it was a very good relationship, you know, answered questions. Some of them probably were deemed, you know, not the smartest, but nonetheless, very respectful and was able to answer questions. And so something I think important um, to make sure would continue with, with the council that, that it was um, our contacts with, with this firm would be people that we felt comfortable and we could work with. And uh, I was happy that that was certainly a consideration by uh, Director Olson, as they picked him, was could could they see their staff interacting with the council um, besides just being competent and and providing all the necessary services? So uh, I was happy to go ahead and support the recommendation. And I, I'll, Councilmember Balch, you were there too, grilling as much. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, thank you. I. Um, so the procedures for an audit are generally pretty consistent. Uh, they're prescribed uh, typically with, with required procedures, uh, typically being pretty consistent amongst providers. So when we talked to the director of finance, there was also who could interact with the city staff, how were they staffing their audit, and specifically what milestones would they meet so that the CAFR would not be delayed. Um, and so when we talked with city staff, about the proposals, uh, this group provided very specific detailed milestones that they would be willing to be accountable to so that we as a city would have timely and accurate financial information uh, produced. And I think that's a, a really important thing to think about. And then the other element that was uh, important is that they are staffing it with a little bit more senior of a group uh, in terms of uh, senior audit managers and uh, we discussed that a little bit as well. It, it'll be staffed out of Sacramento, which um, I'm not sure is a terribly weighty factor, but it was something we noted. So thank you. Questions, uh, Council Member Arkin? No, thank you. That's, that's all I wanted to hear and thank you. Council Member Balch, any comments, questions? Uh, I don't have any uh, questions. I just wanted to point out, or maybe a, just a comment, if I may, Mayor. Uh, I actually asked staff about uh, item number 
uh, seven about the weeds, debris, rubbish, et cetera, being denoted. And I just wanted to, uh, and maybe the city manager can confirm uh, again for me, but you know, this is just a process. And so if people have mitigated in time, uh, by the time it comes around, this is just step one, because I, uh, I had actually visited some of these sites and, and didn't see an issue. But, uh, but again, the city manager clarified that this is just part one. And uh, this is not uh, a heavy handed action. They're just setting the date in the future, if I'm correct, right? Uh, Mr. Nelson. Uh, we, uh, we are, thank you. Uh, we are setting through this action, the public hearing date um, for April 20th um, to hear um, the status of the uh, weed abatement uh, proceedings. All of these properties have received uh, notification of their requirement to abate weeds uh, by the deadline of May 31st. Uh, it's a uh, for those who are watching, it's a, it's a very um, in, uh, extensive fire prevention activity that we do every year, given our landscape and, and, the, and the weed abatement uh, is a really important effort that we uh, oversee. Uh, we get 98% compliance uh, and, um, and we give folks until May 31st and then some, uh, depending on the situation. <clears throat> Most of the folks that uh, don't comply within the timeline are institutions, um, railroad properties, Caltrans, um, you know, other entities like that, uh, and occasionally a resident. And in, in those instances, we try hard uh, to work with them to, to really solve the issue, which is to make the area safe for the summer and fall when fire season um, is in play. Comment or question? Councilmember Valch? Oh, I know. I'm sorry, Kathy that was, yeah, that was my only comment. Thank you. Okay. Mary. I know Kathy and I have seen this come forward, Councilmember Naram, many, many, many times <laughs> each year, weed abatement. So, speaking, uh, Kathy, do you have any, Councilmember Naram, do you have any comments or questions? No, I don't, other than I'll just comment that weed abatement, you know, as much as we see it every year, it's, uh, I think, super important. For our fire safety and given what's happened um, with wildfires and the one last year in August, uh, you know, south of Livermore, yeah, it's uh, all that much more important to take this action, but I don't have any questions. Thank you. Absolutely true. Uh, Vice Mayor Testa, any comments or questions? No, I don't. Thank you. I have two. Um, First of all, I'm very excited about item number three, and that is funding for the skate park design. Uh, we've got quite a few bids on that, and there's lots of, of young folks looking for a expanded skate park at the Ken Mercer Sports Park. And uh, I am also excited about Lifetime Tennis for, or Lifetime's contract for the uh, bocce ball program and leagues. And uh, there was a meeting between staff and some very involved residents and it came out really, really well yesterday. So everybody looks like they're highly supportive of the program for this first year pilot year of outsourcing bocce ball contracts. And then my last question comment is for our city attorney, Mr. Sodergren. Uh, if a council member um, recalls or reads the minutes and they have a change in heart of what they said. Um, is, are they allowed to remove that section from the minutes? The minutes are, are really up to the council as a body. They're the council's minutes. So it would uh, depend on what the majority of the council wanted to do. So a person could actually change their comments because um, I believe the recorded version is the most official version, right? Versus the the um, approved written version. If there's ever a conflict, you go back to the recorded version. That's usually what we do, but but ultimately the, the council as a, as a body has discretion over what it wants to ultimately approve as far as minutes. Great, good to know. Okay, so that is all I have. Uh, now I'm looking for a motion. Uh, Council Member Arkin, are you interested in making a motion for the consent calendar with, I, with the one minutes of February 2nd removed? Yes, I'd be happy to. I will go ahead and move approval of the uh, consent agenda with the exception of 
item one, the February 2nd, 2021 minutes. Council member Balch. I'll second, thank you. We have a motion made and seconded. Could the, if there's no other comments, could the clerk take a roll call vote? Certainly. Council members Arkin. Aye. Balch. Aye. Naram. Aye. Casta. Aye. Mayor Brown. Yes, aye. The motion passes unanimously. Meeting open to the public. And uh, we have a presentation of some proclamations. I assume that would be Council Member Arkin. Yes, it's me again. Okay, thank you. We have two proclamation virtual presentations this evening. This first is recognizing March as American Red Cross Month. After I read the proclamation, Varsha Clare with the local American Red Cross chapter is with us virtually to say a few words. Whereas the American Red Cross Bay Area was founded in 1898 and serves as a leading voluntary agency providing compassionate assistance to people afflicted by personal, local, national, or global disasters. And whereas the Bay Area chapter of the American Red Cross serves nearly 4.5 million people across the counties of Alameda, Contra Costa, San Francisco, and San Mateo. Whereas during the trying year of the coronavirus pandemic and the wildfires of 2020, the Bay Area chapter's 3,000 volunteers helped hundreds of families with temporary housing, clothing, food, and mental health counseling. And whereas the American Red Cross Blood Services supports Bay Area hospitals providing more than 50,000 units of red cells, platelets, and plasma annually to patients in need. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the Pleasant and City Council does hereby proclaim March 2021 as American Red Cross Month and encourages all residents to recognize the compassion, courage, and civic duty inherent in the Red Cross mission to help those in need. So Varsha Claire is with us virtually and has a few words to share. Welcome Varsha. Yeah, I just tried to unmute myself. Oh, okay. I don't know what the process is, but now I know. I guess I'm in. You can hear me? I see all Absolutely, that. welcome today. Thank, thank you, thank you. Um, again, yeah, I'm Varsha Claire. I think I know some of you. I am a member of Alameda County Red Cross Leadership Council. And it is a great honor to accept this annual proclamation from the city declaring March as the Red Cross Month. Since 1943, um, since during World War II, President uh, Roosevelt proclaimed the first Red Cross Month. And since then, every president has designated March as a Red Cross Month. Um, as a community-based humanitarian organization, Red Cross provides relief to those affected by disasters and empowers individuals in our community to prevent and prepare for and respond to emergencies. And Bay Area chapter provides crucial services such as disaster responses. You guys talked about fires, our summer season fires are coming. So there's a lot of work that goes on in supporting people who are affected by fires, supporting armed forces and blood services, which is a very crucial um, area, especially now with all the pandemic and people not able to donate as much as they usually do. So it's, it's a, quite a bit of challenge to, and need doesn't go away. It's just the supply is shorter and shorter. And the main key to the success of, of this organization is volunteers. Uh, in 2020, even with pandemics, something like 7,000 7, people volunteered in Bay Area in Alameda County, over 1,000 people volunteered to serve the community that they all live in. So we are very grateful for the support of the community here and the city. And we really look forward to the continuing partnership to make this Pleasanton a better prepared city for all the emergencies and the disasters that may show up on our doors. So thank you so much for your support and thank you for this proclamation. For all you do for the Red Cross, it, as you stated, it's so important to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Varsha. The second proclamation presentation this evening is recognizing March 24th, 2021 as Equal Pay Day. 
After I read the proclamation, Tina Amber with the Livermore Pleasanton branch of the American Association of University Women will say a few words. Whereas more than 50 years after the passage of the Equal Pay Act, women, especially minority women, continue to suffer from unequal pay. And whereas, according to the US Census Bureau, women working full-time year-round in 2019 typically earned 82% of what men earned. And it's estimated college-educated women working full-time earn more than half a million dollars less than their male peers do over the course of a lifetime. And whereas addressing the gender pay gap has been one of the primary advocacy issues for the American Association of University Women and continues to work to raise awareness for fair pay equity in the private and public labor force. And whereas March 24th, 2021 symbolizes the date in 2021 when wages paid to American women catch up to wages paid to men from the previous year. And now therefore it be it resolved that the Pleasanton City Council recognizes March 24th, 2021 as Equal Pay Day and commends the local Livermore Pleasanton chapter of the AAUW on its efforts and advocacy of gender pay equity. So Tina Amber is with us this evening to say a few words. Hello, Tina, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you for supporting this proclamation. Uh, my name is Tina Amber and I am the membership chair of the local chapter of AUW founded in 1952. I'm the mother of six daughters and the grandmother of eight granddaughters. So this topic is very important to me and to the other women residing in the city of Pleasanton. AUW is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization with local branches founded in 1881. The AUW mission is to advance gender equity for women and girls through research, education, and advocacy. Our focus is on education and training, economic security, and leadership. You may uh, recognize a program's responsor, which is we send 10 middle school girls to a Tech Trek STEM program at Stanford every summer. We put on workshops, um, how to apply to college, we um, uh, put on numerous um, programs open to the public on, on issues of the moment. And we provide scholarships for college age women who are juniors and seniors so they can finish their college education. So thank you very much for support of this and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Tina. And I'll, I'm uh, proud to say that out of the council members, they all are equal pay. Jack doesn't make any more than anyone else. And the mayor makes slightly more, <laughs> but uh, it's a little bit different role, but uh, and ultimately still the same vote on the city council. So equal pay, not very much, but equal pay. Uh, and an important time. issue to us all. <laughs> very important. Yep. Uh, do, city clerk, do we have anybody wishing to speak from the public on items that are not listed on our agenda? We have no speakers. This time I'll close the public hearing and head on to public hearings and other matters. Uh, we have an agenda item 13, which is to receive an update on status of the 2023 through 2031. Gosh, that sounds so far away. Uh, the sixth cycle for RENA here, um, a housing element process and to approve uh, or review and perhaps approve an agreement with the Lisa Weiss Consulting in the amount of $302,000 for the preparation of the city's Pleasanton 2023 housing element and approve an agreement with First Carbon Solutions in the amount of $343,170 for again, the year of 2023 through 2031 housing element environmental impact report. Could I get a staff report, please? Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Mayor and Council. If you just give me a second, I will uh, bring up my screen for the presentation. Are you able to see that? Great. Um, 
So as uh, mentioned by Mayor Brown, staff is here tonight to provide an item in two parts related to the upcoming um, housing element update, the sixth cycle um, update. Um, the first piece of the presentation will be to provide an update on the status of the sixth cycle housing element to date. Um, and that's the process that includes the determination of the city's uh, regional housing needs allocation for the next eight year cycle starting in 2023. And then in the second part of the presentation, uh, staff will, uh, will present two requests for council's consideration for two professional services agreements related to the update um, and, its and its related environmental review. Uh, the first with Lisa Wise Consulting and the second with First Carbon Solutions. Um, other staff with me tonight uh, is Jennifer Hagen, uh, Associate Planner, and she'll be covering the second part of the presentation. Um, and also present and available for questions are representatives from the two uh, consultant firms uh, with Lisa Wise Consulting, Lisa, Lisa Wise, the president of the firm, and David Bergman, uh, their director, uh, and Mary Bean, uh, director with First Carbon Solutions. So um, starting with the status update, um, bringing up this timeline, uh, it illustrates the, ent the entirety of the arena and the housing element process. Um, I've included a red box to indicate where we are today, March, 2021. Um, and that shows that we're about 18 months into what amounts to really a three plus year process um, that will ultimately conclude with adoption of the city's housing element in early 2023. Um, as you can see in the timeline, uh, the bulk of the work to date uh, and beginning that really began in, in late 2019 has it been around work to develop the RENA methodology. And that's shown in the the sort of blue bar here on the left side of the timeline, that's all the, the housing methodology work. Um, in a nutshell, the housing methodology is um, the, the, the formula, the, the combination of formulas and data inputs that are used to, to divide up, to divvy up the total regional housing need that's assigned to the Bay Area region by the state. And that formula is used then to allocate that large regional number to each one of the cities of the, of the Bay Area's cities and counties. Um, the initial regional allocation came about midpoint of the uh, housing methodology process in June of last year. And although there had been an expectation from the beginning of the process that there would be an increase, and that was really based on what we saw in uh, neighboring regions, uh, Southern California and Sacramento in particular, um, an expectation that there would be an increase in the regional number um, that did come to fruition um, with a regional allocation of about 441,000 units across the region in the cycle. Um, and that compares to a number that was closer to 180,000 in the prior cycle, so about a 2.3 fold uh, increase. Um, so moving on to, uh, closer to where we, we are today, uh, as of March, 2021, um, the ABAG Executive Board has made its recommendation on the methodology uh, to the state, to HCD, where it's currently under review. And I'll cover some of those uh, more recent steps as well as what's upcoming in the process in my next few slides. Um, so uh, the city has been very engaged uh, in the process to date, uh, monitoring and, and really tracking what's been happening um, with, with the process. Um, and that's really because that, that ultimately that, that RENA number has a lot of sig uh, potential significance uh, to the city. Um, uh, that participation occurred in a number of different ways. Um, the city uh, was represented on the housing methodology committee as one of two Alameda County uh, uh, staff, represent, staff representatives. Um, and so had an opportunity through that to, to weigh in on the methodology and really observe the sort of inner workings of the initial stages of the, of the methodology process. Um, staff also provided uh, updates to the council along the way and has provided um, those in the form of, of two memorandums that were submitted to the council in March and June of last year, as well as a presentation that we made uh, to the council uh, back in September. And importantly, um, the city took a leadership role in uh, tracking the process, but also commenting on the methodology as it evolved um, over, over the last year. Um, and that included submitting a, a series of, of four separate rounds of comment letters on the draft methodology. And some of those were made in partnership with our Tri-Valley cities, um, as well as with the Alameda County Mayor's Group, um, really bringing to light a number of, of very significant uh, concerns that the city felt were present in the methodology as, as proposed. 
Um, so in terms of where we're at today, uh, the, the HMC, as I mentioned, submitted its, its recommendation to the ABAG board uh, in fall of last year, in September. Um, at that time, and based on the known uh, factors and inputs of the methodology, uh, the city's renin city's allocation stood at around uh, an estimate of around 4,900 units. Um, the, once the HMC made its recommendation, the ABAG Executive Board held a number of public hearings uh, through, through the remainder of the year uh, to receive public comments and to weigh in on the methodology. Um, it's Im Im or impo important to note that during the same period that the, that the methodology was being developed, ABAG was also in the process of developing um, the Plan Bay Area update, Plan Bay Area 2050, uh, which is the long range regional plan, uh, land use and transportation plan for the region. Um, a number of, of fairly significant changes were made to some of the strategies and policies of Plan Bay Area in the draft document towards the end of that process, uh, right before the draft was, was finalized. And that had the effect of, of modifying a number of the housing projections in different parts of the Bay Area, pushing them upwards in certain parts of the region and downwards in others. Um, and uh, one of the reasons that saw those increases was Eastern Alameda County and, and the Tri Valley. So um, when the ABAG board came to recommend adoption of the draft methodology for submittal to the state, um, and that happened um, in, uh, in January of this year, um, Pleasanton's estimated RENA using essentially the same factors that had been proposed by the HMC had been pushed upwards and now stands uh, close to 6,000 units as, as the current estimate. So digging into that number a little bit more, um, uh, you, I've laid that out in this, in this table and slide here. Um, you can see that uh, I've included both the fourth cycle RENA as well as the fifth cycle RENA. And the reason for that is um, the fifth cycle, which was the last cycle, was a little bit of an, an anomaly. It was somewhat of a low dip in our in, uh, compared to past cycles, and that was related to the timing of the fifth cycle relative to the end of the housing of, of the Great Recession and sort of the slump in housing that happened as a result, and that reflected through into the arena allocation. So you can see that the fourth cycle element uh, at around four, around 4,000 units was somewhat closer to the numbers that we're seeing today. Nonetheless, the six cycle arena, if it stands at that approximately 6,000 unit level, will remain a significant increase even over the fourth cycle. Um, but just in terms of, of comparing it to the fifth cycle, the most recent cycle, which is our closest point in time for measurement, um, it represents really something close to a, a 4,000 unit increase over the prior cycle. And you can really see that, that a lot of that increase is focused in, in, a, in a couple of, of categories, um, particularly the very low income categories, as well as the above moderate, the market rate housing. And both of those increased, um, increased substantially. Um, I included a few data points at the bottom of the slide about our housing production um, in the last cycle. And that was information that was presented to you at your last meeting as part of our um, annual planning report that we provide annually to the state on our production. Um, as reflected in that report, over to date, the city has, has, has or well, the city has produced approximately 350 uh, lower income housing units have been produced in, in Pleasanton, and that's about 23% of our total arena allocation. Um, in contrast, uh, we've, we've seen the production of about 1,300 above market rate units. So this is just, that's just standard market rate housing. And that's uh, something close to double what the uh, what the arena allocation was. So the market is certainly uh, willing and able to produce housing in Pleasanton. It's much more challenging, as we know, to produce below market rate units. Um, and as those numbers have increased substantially, particularly in those lower income categories, um, that challenge is going to be significant in the next cycle. Um, and Jennifer, when uh, when she presents her provides her piece of the presentation. Um, we'll be outlining some of the strategies that we'll be looking at to really focus in on, on how we address that potential need. So looking at next steps, um, HCD is, is expected to complete its 60-day review of the methodology uh, by early April. Um, assuming that HCD approves it or something close to that methodology, uh, ABAG will, will take that um, as a cue to then issue a draft regional housing needs allocation to each of the cities and counties of the region. Um, that will occur later this spring. 
Um, that's then followed by a statutory, statutorily required appeal period and process that will take place through, uh, through the spring, sorry, sorry, through the summer and fall, um, concluding with uh, issuance of a final RENA towards the end of the year. So I wanted just to focus in a little bit on the appeals process. Um, for many of the reasons that have been outlined in the city's prior comments, um, staff believes there are valid grounds to appeal the RENA allocation and that it's important really to exhaust all of those um, avenues and remedies that are available to, uh, to challenge the number and to make sure the city receives an allocation that's in fact uh, fair um, as the, uh, and equitable as the allocation methodology is supposed to deliver. Um, however, uh, that comes with a caveat and that um, based on experience of prior cycles as well as recent experience of, of Southern California jurisdictions, um, the odds of having an appeal upheld and, make, and that appeal making a significant difference to the RENA allocation is very low. Um, most appeals are not successful. Um, nonetheless, we think it's important to go through that process, raise our concerns and have them heard uh, by the appeals body um, at the appropriate time. Um, in addition to the appeals process that I just mentioned, um, staff is continuing to monitor the status of a number of challenges that are being raised against, um, uh, not so much against individual arena allocations, but at the larger overall regional housing needs determinations. Um, and those are, those are being lodged really at the state level at this point. Um, there's actually a couple of different uh, moves that are, are, are out there right now um, from groups that believe that the arena allocations are overly large or too high uh, based on flaws in the way that HCD conducted its process uh, with this, at the state level. And there are other groups uh, representing more pro-housing organizations that feel like the numbers are perhaps too low. So competing groups, um, challenging uh, those regional housing numbers. Um, staff will continue to monitor those efforts and outcomes um, uh, to the extent that they might have a different or make a difference to the, uh, to the, to the housing numbers. Um, despite those challenges, despite the appeals process that st is still to come, um, staff does recommend at this time sort of ex taking the, the, the 6,000 odd unit number as at least a working number, initial working estimate for the purposes of beginning our housing element process. Um, we have a complex process ahead of us. It's going to take a number of months to complete, um, including the required review by the public and by HCD, as well as preparation of the CEQA document. And so starting with that initial number, at least as a working number, um, will allow us to get the ball rolling on the housing element process. Um, and there will be an opportunity as we get closer to the end of the process to make adjustments if there are, in fact, any adjustments to the arena that occur out of either appeals or challenges that are filed. Um, so that concludes um, my part of the presentation. I'll pause there before uh, offering the um, uh, Jennifer Hagen uh, to deliver the next part to see if the council has any uh, additional questions for me. Thank you. Would you like to see if uh, council has any questions for you there? Yes, if, if council has, okay. has any right. questions, Thank that would be a great Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, Jack, uh, Councilmember Balch, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, Mayor, if I may. Thank you. Uh, so, um, Ellen, you mentioned that the chances of appeal are small. And then secondly, you mentioned that if uh, an appeal is uh, upheld, maybe, and I'm not asking you to go on record per se, but what do you think the numbers could change by? How much, or if, if we prevailed in the appeal? Are we talking a thousand units, uh, 3000 units? I mean, it's uh, uh, maybe pause there. Yeah, so, so the, the past experience has been that the numbers have not, have not, there's not been significant shift in the numbers. So a handful to maybe a couple hundred is seems like okay. you know, the sorts of order of magnitude that have been have been granted in terms of appeals. Obviously, different sized jurisdictions that could make a bigger or smaller difference, um, but it tends to be more around the edges of the number rather than really significant changes. Okay, so so that's actually kind of what I'm asking. A handful is is 
a couple of hundred uh, to a couple of hundred. So, so, and I try not to put words in your mouth. Would we think a thousand uh, units change is possible through an appeal? And, and the chance of uh, 2000 unlikely is what I am interpreting. Is that a fair interpretation? I, I would say a large, a large shift in the city's arena allocation is unlikely as a result of the appeals process. We can always be hopeful, and I think, as I mentioned, important to go through the process, um, exhaust the avenues that are available to us to, to raise those objections, um, um, and um, do what we can to to get to get to a number that's 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 better uh, and fair, more fair for the city. Okay. Um, okay. I'll, I'll pause there, Mayor, and probably have some more at the end if you don't mind, please. We have uh, uh, Jennifer Hagen doing a presentation as well. Kathy Naram, uh, Councilmember Bernaram, any questions? Yeah, thank you. I just have one kind of a follow on from Councilmember uh, Balch. Um, regarding the appeal, what do you think? What would that be based on that would give us the highest um, chance of success? That, that's kind of part one. And then part two, if we if there are other cities appealing, we also are at risk where if they are successful, um, the numbers that they that their arena is reduced by could in fact be redistributed to cities like us. Um, so if you could just comment a little bit about the basis of the appeal and and the, the the potential risk too of other cities appealing and actually having our numbers go up as a result. Yeah, that, that's a great observation. Uh, Council Member Naram is if it's sort of a zero sum game, there's a total allocation and it gets moved around. Uh, so someone has to absorb someone else's reduction. Um, you know, I, I think the, the prime, primary bases are likely to be those that we raised in our previous comment letters. Um, there were really some significant concerns about the way in which the methodology um, overlooked um, issues of, of significance or jobs production in the South Bay in particular over the past decade and really seemed to fail to, um, to allocate the sorts of housing numbers that would cause uh, some, some communities and, and South Bay counties to have to build housing to meet the needs of the jobs that they've that they've allowed for over the past uh, few years. Um, the flip side of that was that those same housing units seem to flow out to other parts of the region and particularly to the East Bay and North Bay um, seem to be allocated out to some smaller and more rural communities um, in ways that didn't seem particularly, didn't seem to make a lot of sense um, and to the sort of outer fringes of the Bay Area. And so, the outcome of that in staff's evaluation was um, uh, sort of a pattern of land use that's really counter to what this, what the, what the, what the uh, COG, what ABAC has been in the state have been attempting to achieve through their various climate strategies, which is concentrating uh, housing near jobs, addressing jobs housing imbalance, bringing housing into areas that are really well served by transit, the inner Bay area. And the methodology really seems to have failed on many of those on many of those points. And I think um, those are some really compelling arguments to bring to the table in an appeal. Um, and we recognize them during the methodology, and I think they would stand uh, during the appeals process as well. Okay, thank you, Vice Mayor Testa. Any questions? <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, okay, so the appeal process that you're describing um, is appealing to ABAG, our COG, and, but the numbers generate originally from HCD, correct? Yes, the HCD um, generates the regional housing needs determination. That's that big picture, 441,000 unit number comes from the state. Right. So as you pointed out, as um, Councilmember Naram pointed out, 
an appeal to a bag really just redistributes those numbers. It doesn't reduce that original number. So is there a um, future or is there any opportunity to appeal the HCD numbers? Um, I, I can, I can speak right. to that if, if, if they're right. So there's, there's, there's two parts. So the, so as far as our allocations from a bag, the appeals process is the only legal alternative. And that's based on a 2009 case out of the city of Irvine and Irvine at the time challenged this uh, Southern California association of governments allocations. And the court said that uh, because it's a, complicated statutory setup, the arena process that the court declined to hear that, uh, entertain that case. So the appeals vis-a-vis -vis ABAG, the appeals process is really the sole process we have. Now, there are two efforts that I'm aware of, of groups challenging the methodology used by HCD. Uh, and the first one is a, is a case that was filed last month by Yimby Action. It's a pro housing group that was filed in, in Alameda County against HCD. And in that case, they're, they're claiming really that HCD didn't follow the state housing arena statutes by, by failing to adequately take into account and make findings on the Bay Area jobs housing imbalance. And so what they're requesting in that lawsuit is that HCD supplement their analysis. The other effort that I'm aware of is occurring down in Southern California. A number of Southern California cities are, uh, have requested that the Southern California Association of Government, SCAG, that SCAG files suit against the state challenging the methodology. Um, I, I don't believe that SCAG has taken any action to date. So the, those are the two efforts that I'm aware of. There may be others, but like I said, I'm not, those are the only two that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. Um, because there's a lot of concern that research has um, demonstrated that the HCD original numbers are artificially inflated. And so there's a desire to have that revisited. And, and if in fact that was found to be the case, um, there would be potential for a overall statewide reduction, but um, there are barriers to doing that, as you said. I will say that I know right now there is a, an effort to ask for a legislative audit of HCD. So if that were successful, um, that would be a possibility, but that's at least a year or more away if it does happen. Um, so um, Ellen, in fact, you were our representative on ABAG, is that right? Um, I was the, one of the two Alameda County staff representatives on the Housing Methodology Committee. Um, that was a group of 35 stakeholders uh, representing all parts of the Bay Area, um, different cities and counties, um, interest groups, and so on. So I was one of those members. Okay, well, and thank you, because I, I know you fought valiant, valiantly for um, the cities and um, worked a lot on that appeal. Um, so can you explain why the um, number shifted from the original of 4,000, um, our original out, uh, 4,900 units to um, what our current um, allocation is of 5,965. What happened? What, why did that go up instead of down? Um, the, as I understand it from um, conversations that we had with ABAC staff, there were, two, were a couple of um, changes to the strategies that were are embedded in Plan Bay area. Um, one of the more significant ones was um, a um, 
a change in, in emphasis on or expectations about housing production in the South, in the South Bay in particular. Um, and that really came out of sort of an, an inverse strategy, which, which, was, uh, which were, were essentially penalties for businesses not to, not to develop, not to overproduce jobs or not to do it without incurring um, requirements essentially to build housing or to pay substantial fees. And so I think at the, with the objections of a number of South Bay cities, um, that strategy was, was softened. And so that shifted the emphasis of land use in the South Bay to then uh, replace more, more land allocated for housing conceptually, right, in, in sort of the framework planning uh, to jobs, right? So that, that ended up in, in fewer um, housing units, smaller amount of housing growth in the South Bay and that got redistributed in the Bay Area. Um, one of the ways in which it got redistributed was in um, greater emphasis on strategies that called for, they, they described it as redevelopment of aging, aging shopping centers and office parks. So communities that have a lot of shopping centers and office parks like Pleasanton built in the 70s and 80s um, were sort of tagged as opportunity locations for additional housing production and to absorb more of that housing production. And so those two, those two policies in tandem um, and for Pleasanton are, are transit. Um, in fact, we have two, two BART stations and, and have, some, have transit proximity for many of those office park and shopping center areas, um, I think have the net effect of inflating the, the, the housing growth projected for Pleasanton and the Tri-Valley and that translated into an increase in our arena allocation. Well, thank you. You filled in some information that I wasn't aware of um, because what I had heard, and in fact, in reading the ABAG report, um, I read that the, um, the adjustment where was an, what they identified as an equity adjustment. You didn't mention that. And um, you did mention the high opportunity area, but my um, understanding of reading the report is the high opportunity areas were more um, identifying areas and, and, and they have that map, right? And when you look at the map, Pleasanton lights up as a um, high opportunity area and it's really identifying um, high income, high education, opportunities, so good schools, um, proximity to jobs and transit. You mentioned the transit. Um, so that was, I thought, identified as an equity adjustment. Can you explain what the equity adjustment was? Sure, yeah. So the, the two factors you mentioned um, were part of the, were built into the, the methodology and were in fact part of the HMCs methodology recommendation that was ultimately adopted by ABAG. It did emphasize what they called access to high opportunity areas. Um, and that did include places like Pleasanton. Um, the, um, the equity adjustment was sort of a layer that was requested by um, folks who were really in that kind of equity pro-housing community um, for intended to address places where it seemed like the methodology by itself didn't quite address allocations of lower income units to higher opportunity areas. Um, Pleasanton was not one of the cities that um, was affected by that equity adjustment because we were felt to have already met the equity goal. There were some cities that were really out of, well, in the view of, these, of, the, of the people advocating for this change were really out of balance. And those communities did see an increase, but Pleasanton did not see an increase as a result of the equity adjustment. So you're saying that um, the increase of a thousand plus units wasn't out of the equity adjustment? That's correct. Really? Okay, that wasn't my understanding. That's interesting. Bay area primarily. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Well. Um, so I, I, it's great to see that we applied for it, the grants and will be eligible for some grant funding. That's um, a real positive. And um, I'm going to stop there. Um, thank you. Member Arkin, do you have any questions? 
You know, for right now, uh, the only question I have, I think, is with the um, with the estimated uh, arena numbers being such a high number and the very low and low and moderate being high numbers. Um, what is, I, you know, I thought it was in here, but maybe I missed it or didn't see it. Um, our affordable housing fund, how much is in that again right now? Do you know approximately? It's about 15 million currently, approximately. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, that's all I have right now. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I, I kind of know the answers, but for anybody that's watching, Ellen, if you don't mind, uh, does HCD or ABAG take into consideration that Pleasanton's almost built out and the amount of available space is very, very low for a number as large as 5965? Um, in part, ABAG assumes that Plan Bay area will take account of things like how much capacity there is to build. Um, so there are certainly some very constrained cities in terms of you know, fire risk and, and water supply and other things. Um, you know, uh, I, I would say that, so it's sort of, it's sort of built into the process. Um, ultimately, I think HCD and ABAC would say, we're just giving you a number, you decide where you put it. Uh, so, you know, we have, we can plan for it, but it, it is going to likely require redevelopment of existing um, developed properties um, in order that we don't have a lot of vacant land, certainly, to, to build on. Such a heartbreak to see a jobs office building, for example, in the business park to, um, to take it down, to put housing in. And, uh, it just is it's heartbreaking to lose jobs. So 2313, 2313 above moderate. Uh, there's a move away from single family residents, but above moderate, that's a large parcel of land. 2,300 units. It's just mind boggling. Where we, Even if we uh, looked at housing sites near a BART train or the mall, that, that wouldn't house it's not large enough for 2,000 housing units. It's incredible. If we look at the east side or we look at Merritt property or we look at Thermo Fisher, for example, as a potential site for, um, for housing because it's got great transit um, being right near 680 if the landowner is willing, but uh, 2,000 housing units. Um, I just don't know where this is gonna go. Uh, methodology. Uh, there's a couple of rumors going around, and um, I'm going to clarify what I heard you say, that the city of Pleasanton is no way being penalized for our stance now and in the past for local control. Uh, we know our community. We know we get lots of letters from people who don't want to live near an airport, for example. Uh, we, we know how much water we have available. We know how much traffic and school capacity and sewer capacity we have those items aren't being taken into consideration when we're given these regional housing needs allocations. Is that right? Um, well, as I said, I, I, the, it, it's, a, it's a methodology. It's a framework. It's a series of formulas and factors based on characteristics of a community. Um, so as uh, Vice Mayor Testa mentioned, transit, proximity, high opportunity, jobs um, available, um, you know, a whole variety of factors are used to compute that, that allocation. Um, on the micro level of sort of localized constraints, the expectation is that the city, the, the state, and the, and the ABAG will tell us how many units we got to solve for, and then we figure out where they go, um, which lets us account for our local planning constraints in that, in that manner. Wait said it earlier, but like we have two BART stations. I don't think of us as having two BART stations because if Dublin says they have two BART stations, somehow there's four BART stations. Do we have two half BART stations? Or, I guess I'm just sort of picking on you on that. Um, but it is disappointing the number is so significant and uh, I, you know, we're gonna do everything we can to meet our numbers because that's what we need to do, but it's such a big jump that uh, 
it will change Pleasanton forever, that's for sure. And if I did my quick math, 6,000 new units over about 30,000, you're talking about a 20% increase in the city in the next eight years if all those units are built out. So dramatic difference um, to, to absorb. So that's my Mayor, question. If I can ask a follow-up question, please. I think actually the prior council asked this question, but I, I thought it might be wise to ask now, Ellen. Uh, when we, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, when we thought the number is 4,900, I believe the prior council was asking if the Zoom town COVID uh, factors of movement and mobility of people was going to be factored into the number. And I, maybe you could speak on that if appropriate at this time, Mayor, because I think that council believed the number was going to possibly go down because of that uh, mobility of people. Uh, so I'm sitting in a different chair than I thought I was. Good question. Did they take that into consideration that uh, COVID, work from home, uh, has changed the dynamics and the paradigm shift of where people live? Yeah, I, I would say that that came up more in the Plan Bay area discussion, right? Because as the, all of those strategies and projections were being finalized, um, COVID was, was having all sorts of implications on the way that people work and, and travel across across the region. Um, I, ABAG's answer, as I recall, was that they've, uh, in their long range planning, factored some of that in, um, the sorts of um, declines in jobs that might come out of COVID, things like that. So they have different planning scenarios that, that actually accounted for those sorts of really you know, significant uh, seismic shifts in the way that people um, live and work. Um, so more a factor of, of Plan Bay area than in uh, COVID. And I think the other piece of the answer was nobody knows, right? We're all sitting here today and trying to project what the long range outcome of um, the current year, past year has, has been. And um, my sense was there was a reluctance to really commit to saying it's gonna change permanently without seeing or having more time to, to experience what, that, what that's gonna be. So I don't believe they made a lot of changes ultimately in the plan, in the planning to really account for COVID. Um, just because of the long-term nature of the plan. All right, that's all we have for questions then. Um, Jennifer Hagen has a presentation. Yeah. Pull up the PowerPoint. Okay. So as Ellen had described, periodic updates to the housing element, including state certification, are required to ensure that city policies continue to reflect the changing community needs, challenges and opportunities in compliance with state law and updated arena allocations. Although city staff will be involved in all aspects of the housing element update because of the extensive changes to state law and the strict deadlines imposed by these laws, consultant assistance is needed to ensure timely completion of the housing element project. Staff is therefore presenting you tonight two professional service agreements for consideration. The first professional service agreement is with Lisa Wise Consulting in the amount not to exceed $302,001 for the preparation of the housing element. And the second request is for a professional service agreement with First Carbon Solutions in the amount not to exceed $343,170 for the housing element environmental impact report. Each of these contracts before you tonight includes a 15% contingency for general work above and beyond the scope of their project. The funding for the project will include a $300,000 grant that was approved earlier for local early action planning, which is called the LEAP grant, and a $61,755 from a pending non-competitive regional early allocation, or called REAP grant. The city also has applied for an additional $100,000 in a competitive REAP grant, but application uh, has been submitted but has not been approved yet at this time. Any remaining costs, which would be up to about $283,000, depending on the outcome of the competitive grant proposal, are proposed to be funded in the Lower Income Housing Fund. This is consistent with previous housing element updates. 
The overall cost of the housing element has increased from previous major update in 2012 based on the wide range of new requirements and state legislation. However, the overall cost of the proposed CEQA is generally consistent with the 2012 environmental impact report taking into consideration um, just overall costs throughout the years. The previous uh, environmental impact report was finalized at about $300,000. Um, the first professional service agreement that I want to discuss with you tonight is with Lisa Weiss Consulting. The city had issued a request for proposal to firms to assist in the preparation of the update to the housing element. In total, the city received three qualified and competitive proposals. City held initial and follow-up interviews with the proposal candidates. And based on the proposal, interviews, review of the consultant's current and previous works, as well as discussions with their background references, staff is recommending the selection of Lisa Wise Consulting to assist with the preparation of the housing element update. The proposed project is anticipated to last between 18 and 20 months and includes a significant amount of public engagement throughout the process. As part of the public participation, Lisa Weiss Consulting is proposing to draft a public participation plan, which will provide a refined and detailed program for outreach. This program will be presented to the City Council, Housing Commission, and Planning Commissions for review prior to finalizing. At a minimum, staff and the consultant anticipate 25 public meetings and workshops, including key stakeholder meetings, community meetings, city council hearings, planning and housing commission workshops. The participation program will also include assistance in digital and print media as part of the public outreach plan, as well as a housing element update website. Additionally, Lisa Wise will assist staff with presenting policy-based strategies and actions to help with the signed RENA, and all statutory requirements, including updated and revised um, requirements by state law. One of the largest undertakings of the housing element update will be the creation of an updated and likely expanded sites inventory. The scope of work includes a multi-step process to one, inventory the existing sites and evaluate the gaps to be addressed through identification of new sites with the goal to reuse as many sites as possible, Two, to determine criteria, preferences, and priorities in locating sites and build upon the requirements of state law, as well as criteria developed in past cycles, and allocating appropriate, de appropriate densities to those sites. And lastly, identify select, identify, select, and rank additional suitable sites for inclusion in the housing element. Throughout this process, Lisa Weiss Consulting and city staff will work closely with HCD to ensure that city inventory complies with HCD requirements. In addition to the site inventory analysis, Lisa Wise Consulting will assist in providing technical studies and analysis of all other statutory requirements of the housing element that are typically found in the background report and may include these following sections, including the review and assessment of existing policies and programs, housing needs assessment, housing constraint, housing constraint assessments, and so on. After concluding all the technical studies and assessment, Lisa Wise Consulting will be able to provide the city with a comprehensive housing element to include quantifiable housing objectives and housing goals and policies and programs, as well as a complete background report and housing sites inventory. Based on our initial timeline goals, the city anticipates having a housing element public review draft in the summer of 2022 to be able to present to the Housing Commission, Planning Commission, and City Council for review, as well as submit to HCD for the required 60-day review period. Following the public review draft, the city will lead a final sites inventory discussion in the fall of 2022 to choose the final sites to be included in the housing sites inventory and make any changes needed based on the final RENA allocation and or any appeals, and then present the final draft to the commission and council for adoption and to HCD for certification in the winter of 2022 to meet the HCD deadline of January, 2023. The second professional agreement professional service agreement before you tonight is for First Carbon Solutions. In January of 2021 this year, the City Council approved a list of on-call CEQA consultants, which included First Carbon Solutions. Staff reviewed the consultants on the approved list and based on qualifications is recommending approval of First Carbon Solutions based on their extensive knowledge of the city's current housing element EIR, as well as analysis for six different addendums on existing housing element inventory sites within the current cycle that First Carbon has provided. 
As part of the project scope, First Carbon will prevent prepare an environmental impact report for the housing element update consistent with CEQA requirements. This EIR will be structured to allow for tiering of subsequent projects developed on the various housing element sites similar to the previous housing element EIR to allow for a more streamlined review in the future. In addition, First Carbon will provide analysis in each of the topical sections outlined in CEQA guidelines, including air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, energy analysis, and water supply assessment, as well as others. First Carbon Solutions will also subcontract with Fair and Pierce to provide traffic impacts for the project to include analysis to focus on vehicle miles traveled or VMT, as well as incorporated intersection specific traffic impacts or level of service to be included in the community concerns evaluation. In conclusion, staff has worked diligently with both consultants to refine their scopes and blend their prospective timelines together to be able to achieve our goal of final adoption in January 2023. This includes a robust timeline starting immediately with kickoff meetings to the Housing Commission, Planning Commission, and City Council within the first month to two months. Staff anticipates working with both consultants throughout the summer, preparing initial sites inventory methodology and criteria and technical background studies, and able to refine our initial sites inventory in the fall and winter, and prepare a comprehensive CEQA project description by the end of this year to allow for the technical CEQA studies to begin in early 2022. Our goal, as stated previously, is then to have a housing element public review draft in the summer of 2022 to be able to present it to the commissions and council for review as well as submitted to HCD. This would then allow for the final site selection to happen in that, that fall with adoption and certification by the end of 2022. So staff would like to thank you for your time tonight. And this concludes uh, with staff's recommendation one more time to receive the updated status report for the six Rena cycle, approve a professional services agreement with Lisa Wise Consulting and approve a professional service agreement with First Carbon Solutions. And that concludes staff support and we are available uh, as well as um, representatives from each of our uh, prospective consultants to answer questions. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, going back to uh, Council Member Balch uh, on this line on this item, do you have any questions of staff? I got the short straw on this item. I can see. Uh, well, thank you, staff. Uh, so, quick couple of questions, if I may. Um, so, twenty-five meetings, as you mentioned in the Lisa Wise Consulting Agreement. Um, so, I've I've participated in them in the past, but I never knew how many meetings we had taken or done in the past for public outreach. Uh, given the number we're talking about here or just presented in part one, I'm assuming you're thinking that's enough outreach or that's an adequate number of meetings or, or public meetings. Can you tell me if that's light, heavy, appropriate? We, we think it's a, a generous allocation of, of public meetings. Um, you know, we, we try to be conservative in the number of conservative meaning, generous in the, in the number of meetings that we planned for um, since so often in processes here in Pleasanton, uh, there's a desire for more input rather than less. Um, there may be some opportunities to um, be a little bit more efficient in terms of just of, of for example, having joint meetings um, of, for example, the, the Housing and Planning Commission or between the Planning Commission and Council at certain times. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a balance between wanting to, we need to keep the, the process moving, uh, that's really important, but also giving really ample opportunities for the public to weigh in and for our uh, commissions and for the council to weigh in as well. Okay. Um, I'm assuming there's a lot of organizations or cities, municip municipalities trying to get their housing elements completed around the same timeline, same schedule. So. Are we comfortable that the vendors, and I hate to say it so generally, but that they will deliver on the milestones so that uh, we will have a product at the end of this or at the milestones you've outlined? They better. <laughs> um, so yes, I, I think that was one of the factors in our in our decision making was with one of the, the other firms we talked to is working on, I would say scores of housing elements right now uh, for Southern Cal California communities for, um, Bay Area communities and um, Lisa Wise is doing a smaller number of housing elements. Um, they have a few that are on the leading edge of the process in terms of 
uh, SACOG and the SCAG process as well. Um, but we were really impressed by their um, commitment to really give us you know, personalized service and the level of uh, attention, particularly at a senior level that we were looking for to help us through this process. So, so yes. I like the, your better the part. You have to, get, uh, have to get it done. So. We have to get it done. And, and then um, maybe a question as to process, right? I, I expect that the city of Pleasanton residents and voters will have a very keen interest in the site selection process. I'm assuming that gets distilled out at some point in this uh, as, we, as we go forth, as, as Mayor Brown kind of mentioned, different sites offhand. Uh, maybe you could just generally comment, who comes up with that? A city staff or vendors, or is it uh, a co uh, collaboration to recommend a site selection process and then ultimately the list approved by council, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, it's, it's likely to be a sort of a combination of those things. We have an inventory of existing sites from our current housing element, and that's clearly got to be our starting point. Um, and then, you know, I will say over the last couple, three, four years, um, we often have people coming through the door and they own various pieces of property around Pleasanton, much of which isn't zoned for housing today, and have said to us, you know, what would it, what would it take to build a housing, a housing project here? And um, we've, we've, we've encouraged all those folks to keep an eye on the housing element process. Um, once, once we've gone through the process, I think, and that's the most important starting point is to really focus in on what the community thinks is important, um, what the state's requirements are for selection of sites and use, it, use those as really the guiding parameters to um, both to start to identify sites, but also to invite uh, property owners who might be interested in having sites considered as part of the process come to us with, with proposals. And that, um, the, the, that then the criteria that, that have been selected by the community to evaluate those sites will be used to rank and sort and decide among the, the number of sites that we might have in front of us. So uh, it's gonna be, a, it is, it's, I mean, as, as I think, as one of the other council members suggested, it's a formidable challenge this year. It's a lot of units that we have to um, find locations for. Some very important decisions to be made around uh, preferred densities for sites, because obviously the more density you allow for, um, the less land you have to dedicate. And so there's a balance there between finding um, densities that fit and work within different areas of the city, uh, accommodating the need and um, making the most efficient use of the valuable land that we have. So it's, it's gonna be a complex process. And I think that one that's really, as Jennifer outlined, likely to take really the, the entire first year of the process to sort through and to come up with that inventory. Yeah, and I think you hit on my next question and I'll just maybe ask it a different way. So when I look at the very low at uh, 1,750 units and I know Pleasanton has enjoyed or preferred a 30 unit per acre, I mean, that's 58 acres of land if we you know, had it so, so in town, right? So they, through this process, these vendors and the city staff will be looking at, you know, maybe a changing densities closer to transit or maybe an opportunity areas uh, and how it impacts everything else, right? So that process is going to be ferreted out with the public input in, in through this, correct? That's right. And okay. just to be just to be clear, it hasn't been our preference. It's been it's been the default number that um, has been assigned uh, to the city to meet its uh, low and very low zoning obligations, 30 units to the acre. Um, but even with that, um, in the last arena cycle and the one before that, we did we did identify a few sites um, that received higher density. I think the highest we went in the last cycle was 40 or 45 units to the acre approximately. So that, that becomes more important as you, you know, look at a lot bigger numbers and um, are faced with the challenge of finding acreage to accommodate those densities. Um, I, I know it's at a different point in the future, so I, I'll just preface the question that it's okay if we decide to punt, but 
is there a conversation about our inclusionary numbers, 20%, 80%? Because if we were trying to look at that, uh, even using a 2080 allocation on the inclusionary, 1,750 units, that's, that's 8,700 units of housing. It overshoots the moon by quite a lot. So when we talk about a 30 per unit project, um, we're, we're really talking about how much is our, our uh, portion very low and low, right? Yeah, that, that, that's going to be a, a significant or I think an important consideration is the assumptions that we make about delivery of lower income units on high density sites, because in practice, it's generally been our inclusionary requirements that have delivered that percentage of that 20% or so of, of affordable units within market rate, rate projects. Um, so you could come up with a different set of assumptions, um, but but we um, we need to be thoughtful about how we build those in because as you say, if you only assume each site is gonna produce 20% of its units as affordable, you have to zone a whole lot more land in order to meet the 1700 odd lower income housing unit allocation. Which is very low. And then we got another thousand at low. Uh, okay, so, so then my last question and then I'll pause. Uh, when we look at the timeline that you've outlined 20 something months left until uh, January of 23, uh, is this approximately the time that, that we would normally start? Uh, because after hearing the presentation and the conversation tonight, I'm feeling like we need to giddy up uh, pretty quick here. Yeah, the, in, in discussing the timeline with our consultants, um, I think we're starting at, at a good, good time. Probably would all be nice to start a little earlier, but I think, I, I think we're starting in a timely way and, and one that can get us to our January 2023 deadline, it's going to require us to be focused and efficient and get and get through the process um, in order to meet that goal, but but it can be done. Okay, thank you, Mayor. That concludes my comments or my questions. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Councilman Bernera. Oh, thank you. Um, regarding the proposal from Lisa Weiss Consulting, um, it reads like the plan is to use the Planning Commission to maybe lead the effort on the site selection and everything. Is, is that correct? Um, when we uh, had the discussion with the council towards the end of last year, um, that proposal was made for the planning commission to, I'll call, say sort of do more of the heavy lift on the detail of sorting through <clears throat> the policies, the sites. Um, I, I hope that you saw in their proposal many check-in points with the council along the way. And that includes um, during the site criteria identification, it includes uh, at the draft sites evaluation piece. Um, so we really recognize the importance of having the council weigh in and steer the ship um, and give the, give the planning commission the direction that they need um, and sort of ratify or modify decisions that are made to make sure that the project remains on course. So it's a combination of both. The Planning Commission is probably doing a little more work um, and uh, the Housing Commission is involved as well, um, but there will be a lot of check-in points with the council. Okay, I mean, I'm, I guess I was happy to see that because I had heard or had thought there had been some discussion perhaps going to a task force. And so I'm happy to see that carried through um, which leads to the next question. In 2012, there was the task force um, that was given the year to make the site selections for that uh, arena um, allocation, you know, coming out of the lawsuit. And part of that, uh, or there were criteria developed for how to rank the properties. And I was wondering if the work done by that task force um, uh, would be shared or, or used as perhaps a starting point for uh, the consultant? Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, that is a really, was a really thoughtfully developed um, set of criteria, I think based on the low income tax credit framework, um, which talks about things like transit proximity and you know, transportation utilities, having being, you know, having utilities ready, ready to go to the site, that sort of thing. So a really good set of criteria that we will uh, certainly use as a start, starting point and have already communicated that to our 
consultants um, or prospective consultants um, as a really valuable input. Okay. And my last question is with the east side. Um, I, I didn't see any reference to the east side. Um, if the desire is to include that for some of this, will there be a separate process for kind of how that would look or what the plan would be? I, um, so yeah, so that so I think that's going to be a really um, important part of the site's discussion. And as we we talked about, I think it was more than a year ago now um, when we we brought the the East Pleasanton discussion to the council with direction to move forward. And that's obviously been been paused um, during COVID. Um, but in some form or fashion, there will have to be a conversation about East Pleasanton. Obviously, in your work plan discussion that's coming up in the next month or so. Um, East Pleasanton remains on the work plan. And so um, depending on what the council decides about how to proceed with that effort and how that might fit into the housing element and frankly, what gap we may need to solve for through the sites analysis will all be all be input. So a little bit, it's a little bit up in the air, I would say East Pleasanton is, a, is certainly a factor as it always has been in discussion of, of the housing needs um, and meeting that need. Thank you, that, that's it for my questions. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Testa. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see, the inventory of existing sites was mentioned. Are we allowed to reuse those remaining um, unused sites from previous, um, is that allowed in this cycle? Th there are some limitations around use of sites that have been in the housing element or, or in more than two, one or more cycles up to two, in, in, eh, I'm not saying that well, two pr prior cycles. Um, there are some provisions that do allow for them to be included. If you modify um, the zoning process and the entitlement process to be much more as of right. Um, HCD can allow for an exception for those sites to continue to be reused. There's other sites um, that um, if the development project or profile were modified on them, for example, if the, dens if the density were adjusted, um, would constitute a new site for the purposes of this RENA cycle. So we will be creative um, we would love to be able to reuse as many of those sites that we've already gone through the effort of identifying and, and, and planning for. Um, there may be some sites, however, that do fall out of contention just because HCD is, is, is not going to accept them uh, because of their use through prior cycles. Do you have an estimate of how many um, units we will be able to whittle off yeah, um, so staff actually, when we learned of the, of the magnitude, even back when, it, when the number was closer to 48 or 4,900 units, um, started to do some preliminary analysis of kind of, of what we might be able to carry over. Um, I would estimate that we have somewhere between 800 at the low end, 1,500 or more at the high end that could be applied to our, the, the current cycle. Um, based on reuse of sites that remain viable, have not yet developed. Okay, great, thank you. Um, question, um, so in 2023, when the new cycle starts, um, let's see, you said earlier that we had uh, met 200% of our market rate, but clearly we were substantial significantly under on our um, very low and low. So are we starting new or do we still have that remaining, those remaining units? Um, do you mean, do we have to carry over right. that number? Does it add to what we have? No, it does, it's, it's starting over. So the cycle is fresh. Right. Um, it's a new number um, that we have to solve for. It's the, the existing unmet need is not added on, on, on top of that. Okay, good. I, I, I knew that, but I thought it was a question, question that some others might want to know. 
Um, can you, there was a lot of confusion and discussion about the change in the VMT versus, and I, it, that was in our staff report. Um, could you help me understand what that change was? Yeah, so, so that was a change that was made uh, at, the, at the state level a few years ago. Um, it's only just been come into effect, become effective. Um, that's a rule that says in CEQA analysis, you can only consider vehicle miles traveled as a threshold for, um, for traffic impacts. Um, what has what is no longer allowed to be considered is our traditional level of service intersection level impacts for the purposes of CEQA. That does not preclude the city from analyzing, presenting in sort of supplemental uh, or you know as part of the council's consideration of a project what those LOS impacts might be. So that will be discussed and disclosed through the um, through the technical review by the traffic consultant. Um, it just can't be something that we can use to base a significance finding on in the EIR. Okay. Um, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you Council Member Arkin. Yes, thank you. Um, let me see. Some of these questions may be for Ms. Clark, some may be for Ms. Hagen. So I'll start with, um, and I think uh, Ms. Clark, you already touched on this a little bit with Will we be, I, I'm kind of looking for proactive um, with discussions, outreach to commercial um, property owners regarding, you know, converting their properties possibly into like workforce housing, something like that. Will that be done on a more proactive basis? Yeah, we, we already have an existing list, as I mentioned, of sort of folks who have expressed interest over the last couple, three years in in housing projects on those sorts of sites. Uh, Jennifer's been diligently uh, stashing that information away in her, in her database. And, and that's a great starting point for, for really a mailing list to say, the housing element process is underway, you know, pay attention, there will be an opportunity if you wanna come forward with a proposal for a site. Um, that's really important because HCD looks at, especially for redevelopment sites, so sites that already have stuff on them, um, for partnership, for willing property owners, for commitment to actually move forward. So it makes a big difference when it's a property owner saying like, saying, yes, I'm interested in, in, in doing something with my property. Um, that has a lot of resonance with, with HCD. So um, in answer to your question, yes, we will be proactive. Um, we'll be shaking the trees, I'll say, you know, for, for folks who, who may, be, may be interested because it, it's gonna be a challenge this year. Thank you. And you touched on this before too. This is quite challenging. And like you said, a very daunting process. So um, the number is quite large, whatever the number ends up being. Um, what, what does happen if there is a real issue with identifying you know, enough sites to fulfill that number? I, I mean, I know you mentioned we just, we have to, but can you foresee any possibility of us really having an issue with attaining that and, and what happens then? Um, you know, I think, I think we can get there. It's, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be a challenge. I think it's gonna require some potentially some strategic thinking as, as Nelson uh, indicated about, about site densities, right? And sort of making the most of the sites that we have in, in the right locations. Um, and I'll, I, that's an important caveat, right? Because dense, high density projects do not belong everywhere and don't fit everywhere. Um, but there are places in town where they might may make some sense. Um, so I think it's achievable. Um, you know, I, I think HCD is recognizing, and ABAG actually is recognizing the challenge that is out there for not just for Pleasanton, but for every city in the Bay Area, almost without exception. Um, and so they're offering a lot of resources this, this cycle, um, both in grant funding, as we've seen, um, but also in technical assistance and creating those um, opportunities for connection with HCD to work um, cooperatively to try and address the sorts of challenges that, that we, we and other cities are going to face in really having a good inventory. Because if, if HCD draws the line and, and excludes, you know, half of the sites that we bring forward to them, I'm not sure that that helps their cause either for a bunch of cities to have non-compliant non housing elements. So 
um, it's it's going to be difficult, but I think the the sentiment is like we're all in this together. <laughs> we're going to have to be really creative and and work collaboratively with HCD and with ABAC staff to to kind of to, to solve the problem. Okay, and another question I have is with the site selection. Um, I, and I know this is a hard one because the number's so large. I mean, there, it's a hard one to factor in, but the infrastructure impact. So, and I'm thinking of the schools. Um, you know, we have some areas that are more impacted than others in town with schools, but with this large of a number, I mean, honestly, every area it could be it could potentially be impacted. But will that be? And and not even just the schools. Um, you know, traffic concerns, whatever. Um, will that be taken into consideration? But I am primarily asking about the schools because I really do know that's going to be a major impact, big one. Um, is that going to be considered as we do site selection? Yeah, I, th I think all, all of the above. So, so schools, services, utilities, um, transportation, all of those things are going to come into play. I think the city is going to have and the community is going to have, and the council is going to have some very difficult decisions to make about about these housing sites because inevitably you can't you can't create zoning or or identify sites for uh, six thousand new residential housing units, all of which may generate school age kids um, without having some impact on our existing schools. So I think it's a combination of understanding what the impacts are, trying to minimize them and working collaboratively with, with P, collaboratively with PUSD um, to try and figure out ways to address, um, you know, address that increased demand that's, that's inevitable. Okay, and um, just to kind of recap on this, that this, I know there's a lot of lobbying efforts um, about the state providing funding for infrastructure and providing funding for the affordable housing piece. But as of right now, there is no talk from the state of providing either of those, correct? Um, there's some fairly significant um, proposals coming through the legislature to help to support uh, affordable housing production, um, to subsidize housing, to provide incentives. Um, on the regional level, there's a new, and I, 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 I'm probably, I'll quickly get out of my depth on this, but an entity I think called BAHFA that's really dedicated to facilitating resources to support production of affordable housing because I think the state recognizes that's a significant challenge. It requires subsidy. Um, you know, the private sector has a hard time building it, except, if, except in the nonprofit world. Um, so, that, that resource is the other side. And so I think that's a great um, question to mention sort of the other side of the housing element, which is not just the sites that we have, but there's also a whole suite of policies and programs that will be included in the housing element that really help to set up um, the sorts of strategies that the city can use to help particularly to, to, to build uh, or to create and, to, and facilitate production of affordable housing in particular. Okay, thank you. And this question might be for Ms. Hagen. Um, regarding that, since this is not going to be a task force and this will be public meetings, and um, I did read the consultants are going to do all kinds of outreach with social media and online submission, and that I'm very happy to see. But um, I would just, I, I'm assuming it'll be very broad outreach um, and multiple ways to. Um, to reach out to residents here. But also, um, I would assume there's going to be multiple times there will be like online submission, for instance, of some sort of survey or whatever it may be. Um, I know, you know, a lot of people are busy and that might be the only way they can give input. So I'm assuming over the, there will be multiple opportunities for residents, not just one short little window to give input. There will be, can you just maybe comment on the outreach part? Yeah, so the community outreach for the housing element update um, is pretty much going to be continuous throughout the whole entire um, cycle, the next 18 months. Um, we will, within the next few months, have our, our website going up. 
um, on that website, you know, we'll have contact information um, for me as, as the lead here on staff, who's obviously, you know, available Monday through Friday at any time to um, answer questions or communicate with, you know, prospective property owners and residents with their concerns. Um, but yeah, we do anticipate having various um, surveys throughout the year. Um, and obviously every Planning Commission meeting, Housing Commission, City Council. Um, what we had provided last time was um, an option on the, the Housing Element website where you could provide your contact information. Um, and then we do email blasts for every single um, commission meeting, every single council meeting, all the community meetings to anybody who wants to provide their contact information. Um, so we do try to get as many people involved as possible, as many times as possible throughout the entire process. Okay, thank you. That's great. I think that'll 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 be great for our residents. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Some great questions. So I'm going to touch back on what uh, Councilmember Arkin talked about for aggressive outreach. Are you? Is anybody from the city or from um, Lisa Weiss going to pick up the phone and call large landowners and ask if they would consider a zoning? Uh, change to housing? I mean, is it is it that kind of aggressive or is it just, hey, you didn't read about it in the Pleasanton Weekly, therefore you missed it? Um, I, I'm anticipating um, uh, e email outreach, um, phone calls if we have contact information. Um, you know, it, it's almost going to be sort of a, a request for a solicitation for of interest, right, in, in bringing forward proposals and, and trying to blast that out into as many corners as, as we can. Um, we know that there, we, we're, you know, we're familiar with many of the larger property owners in, in, uh, in Pleasanton. We've had actually a number of conversations with James Paxson in Hacienda, who is obviously much more attuned with movement of, of property and, and interest in sort of changes to property in, in Hacienda. So those sorts of uh, strategic relationships, I think, will be, will be important. So um, yes, we, we will be reaching out as directly as we can and as broadly as we can to, uh, to solicit that, that, that interest. Terrific, because I'm, I'm, again, thinking, you know, sometimes just pick up the phone because it's a complex process about would you accept zoning on your land in addition to the zoning you have um, or eventually for housing. And um, mobile homes, we have two large mobile home parks off of, uh, Vineyard Avenue, and many people consider those affordable housing. So in any of the discussions about RENA and low income and affordable housing, have, have topics like mobile home parks or have ever been, I know the density is low, but has that ever been discussed? Um, Jennifer, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there's actually a, that's one of the sort of, I say protected, more protective classes because they really are some of the most affordable housing in the community. Uh, people are able to lease or, or, or have a, occupy a mobile home for just you know, a, a relatively low cost. Um, so the state I know certainly has an interest in preserving mobile home parks and mobile home park affordability. Um, I believe we have policies in our housing element today around mobile home park preservation um, and I don't know if that goes so far as to say, have we talked about encouraging more mobile home parks in Pleasanton? That's probably a policy discussion for the process. Um, but yeah, I think we recognize that mobile homes are a really valuable source of, of, of lower income and more affordable housing. Our in our two or on over 55. Mm -hmm. um, and then a last question for me as we go, uh, it's my understanding in the general plan talks about feathering. So the most dense housing would be in that downtown business park transit areas. But as you go to the outer edge of our community, it would be really um, uncomfortable to see, let's say off of Sycamore Creek or off of um, on the very edge of town, I'll say even the east side, to put a four-story building out on the fringe of town. Is that good planning normally or, or, or is it normally to condense the density in closer to those transit rich areas, shopping and so forth, schools? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, a very uh, common planning principle is you concentrate density where there's um, access to transit, good transportation links, um, 
shopping, you know, places so people don't have to drive very far to get to where they're going. Um, you know, there, there can be opportunities in, you know, and I'll, I'll just say East Pleasanton to sort of create neighborhoods. Sometimes you can kind of create a node and, and there might be within that node um, uh, density that sort of feathers out sort of within that own, that particular area. Um, so there's different, it's not quite as, as black and white as that, but in general, your statement is, is correct that you generally focus density where you have the most um, transit access, access access to convenient shopping and so on. Oh, there you go, tag, tag on one last question. When uh, HCD and ABEG give us these requirements for our new housing element, um, is there ever a concern about age-restricted housing? So do they, do, does, um, do they care if they're age-restricted or non-age-restricted housing? Um, housing for seniors is one of the categories that the city is required to plan for in the housing element. So we actually have to specifically address that need. Um, you know, I, I don't know that it's necessarily a, a, a detriment to, to, to have senior housing in your community, but I think it's, a, it's really in HCD's mind providing housing for all sectors. So not just seniors, but large families or you know, um, uh, lower, lower income people, right? All of those types and classes and categories of, of folks that have a housing need in the community of which seniors are one have to be, um, that has to be addressed in the housing element. We like our seniors to stick around. Okay, that's all my questions. Seeing no other questions, I'm gonna open the public hearing. Uh, City Clerk, do we have anybody to speak on uh, this item? Yes, we have one speaker, Becky Dennis. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Hi, thank you. <laughs> so, got a tough job uh, figuring this one out. Uh, <laughs> my questions are, you know, I don't really buy the state's numbers about what housing we should build. I think, you know, as a housing advocate as, and as a sort of climate advocate, I really uh, think that we should try to fully mitigate our own housing impacts. And so the, uh, the, the appeal that we wanna make about our numbers, uh, I would really focus on the above moderate income numbers, even uh, I mean, that's really gonna kill our ability to meet state climate goals. So that's in conflict. It would be better really to take, even if you added numbers in low and very low income housing uh, and sort of let the above moderate folks take care of themselves. Because if we do uh, manage to com convert some commercial properties to housing, we'd be, be lowering our own housing demand that is shown in our nexus studies would tell us, you know, when have we actually balanced Pleasanton's housing stock? So, you know, we don't wanna do what's, what the South Bay is doing. We don't wanna have jobs and not enough housing. And I think I would suggest maybe that the city could look for some legal refuge in a superior uh, goal, which is to say, we aren't gonna burden the communities around us. We are gonna take care of our own needs. And that involves, you know, X many units of uh, affordable housing uh, and, uh, and in these income levels. And we can prove that all through our own Nexus study. So I would base the appeal more on that rather than the methodology, which as you all have pointed out to me many times is as messed up as it can be, but, uh, I really feel like we're in a very defensive position and we could be in a more of a leadership position. Uh, and I, I appreciate the fact that you are gonna be uh, going to commercial property owners. I think that that's a really good thing. The other thing I think we should do is look at redoing our fee structure to let the fees, I, I'm a big fan of saying charge the maximum fees Let's, let's add to the affordable housing fund because to the extent that we buy the workforce housing that we need, we can control 
the, uh, can, you know, we can basically open that up more to, to the workforce locally and we can get some, some good credits for that. I mean, I don't know if you have any questions about what I wrote to you all, um, uh, but I'm happy to talk about it now or another time. I just uh, hate to see us really stuck in a uh, defensive posture when I don't think it really gets us there environmentally anyway. Thank you. And that's our only speaker, so I'm gonna close the public hearing. I'm gonna go to Council Member Nero, if you would like to make a motion or any other comments or pass it on to someone else. Thank you. So uh, I'm happy to um, move that we approve and authorize the city manager to execute a professional services agreement with Lisa Wise Consulting for an amount not to exceed $302,001 and $1 for the preparation of our um, housing element for 2023 to 2031, and also approve uh, the associated EIR um, and authorize the city manager to execute the professional services agreement with First Carbon Solutions for an amount not to exceed $343,170 and I do have actually several comments I'd like to make. Um, you know, I was a member of the task force back in 2012 that was given 12 months by the courts to get some 70 plus acres um, rezoned or, or identified and rezoned for um, the housing element. And I think it's worth commenting that council member Arkin's uh, husband was also a member of that. And, uh, I think he played a big role in, in setting the direction of that task force to say, you know, let's try to really spread uh, uh, the different units out throughout the city. And that, you know, that process, it was a very good one, but it took 12 months to end up um, identifying, I think it was about 74 acres, and as I recall, about 2,400 units. Here we're talking about nearly 6,000. And, you know, looking at trying to get that done in 18 months or so. So I think somebody said it, but it's like, you know, we need to get going. And, um, and the sooner we do, the more time we have to really work with the community, um, tap into, you know, some of our housing experts, both on the land side and, and residents like Becky Dennis that maybe can offer some creative solutions for us. Um, you know, I'll acknowledge that, you know, there's certainly been a lot of conversation about um, the question of, are the numbers from HCD the right ones? And, and are they in fact, um, have they been double counted? And I, I not necessarily going to disagree with that, but if you stop and think about it, even if they have been double counted, we're still facing uh, 3,000 units, which was still, I think, 20% more than what we had to do in uh, 2012 or so. Um, so I, I just think it, it continues to speak to we really need to get going. I would like to think there's a little bit of a silver lining here that if we do this right, we have an opportunity to provide sites for um, some areas of housing that we need, such as, or that would be you know, good to have in our communities, such as the vets. We talked about the senior housing, you know, perhaps another Sunflower Hill project, uh, affordable housing for entry-level teachers, et cetera. So all, um, members of our community that I think are important and, and deserve housing. Um, I, I'm encouraged by the, the consultant's proposal about the robust uh, public participation plan. I will be interested to see that. I think it's really critical. Uh, as I recall from the 2012, we probably had between 15 and 20 meetings. Um, total, including the, the 12, I believe it was 12 task force meetings. So the idea of 25, I think makes sense and probably will be needed. Um, and, and I think one of the reasons it's important to do that is that 
that, you know, we really want to try to do this in a way where we minimize the impact to our existing neighborhoods. And, um, and as we talked earlier through questions, we maximize that affordable housing piece. So whatever the site is, um, does it make sense? Is 30 you know, units to the acre the right number? Should it be more so that, that we can really figure out um, how to get this done? Because I, I just, I think it's, a, it's gonna be a big lift for us. Um, you know, there was a couple comments made. As I recall, I believe the BART parking lot at Hacienda was zoned for about 50 units to the acre. Um, I'm hoping, I would hope that that can continue to count um, towards, towards this number, whatever it ends up being. And the other thing that um, <clears throat> I wanna point out that during the task force meetings, we had a number of property owners come and ask to be rezoned. And we did have a few that said, please don't rezone me. Um, and um, we, that, that group respected those people that said, you know, not interested, thank you. So I think that there'll be a lot of interest in this. I did have a call from a property owner today that is interested in, in being rezoned for housing. And I told him to, you know, tune in tonight and begin to see what the process is gonna be. So I'm hoping that that well, I agree that we absolutely need to do outreach to the property owners. I, I'm also hopeful that these property owners or a number of them will step up that are interested in and uh, have some creative ideas on how to get this done without just dramatically altering the character of our city necessarily. So those would be my comments. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, Vice Mayor Julie Testa, would you like to make comments or a second the motion? Um, I would like to make comments. Um, I have absolute faith that our staff, together with input from the community, will successfully um, certify, successfully certify a, a housing element where we have identified sites for all 6,000 minus those carryovers, um, housing units in all of the um, categories, affordability categories identified. I believe that we will, that our staff can do that and will successfully do that within with the help of the consultants within the time frame required. <clears throat> the difference this cycle is that the requirement is no longer just Sony. For, for many years, we were able to say the, the responsibility of the city is to zone the land and not production, not actually get the housing built because we don't have the tools and we don't have the funding to actually get the housing built. But what's different this year, this cycle, is there are production um, mandates. There will be punishments for, I think there are two-year check-ins and if we're not meeting those production requirements, at those points, there can be consequences. There almost certainly will be consequences. And so while I have absolute confidence and we will move forward and we will do everything that's required of us to, to identify and, and zone those sites, without the tools and the funding to be able to make it happen, the fact that we exceeded, we built 200% of our market rate in the last cycle, but hit, and I didn't catch what the percentage was. It was 300 and some units of our affordability out of about, um, I think it was close to 2000 units. The reason that we're able to do that is the, the majority of our affordability comes out of inclusionary housing. So along with the market rate, we build 15 to 20% inclusionary. 
if we were to successfully build all of the affordable units required in this cycle through affordable housing, um, Council Member Balch kind of alluded, started to, to do the calculation there, but to do our entire 2,758 units of low and very low housing and factor that in accomplishing that through our 20% inclusionary, we would have to build 13,790 units, almost 14,000 units. And that isn't attainable, that isn't reasonable. So if, we, if we're not able to do that, because we really can't and we don't have the land, that's just, that's, that's, I, the building industry says they can't even, they can't build the kind of housing that the state would need to meet all of these mandates. So if we can't do that, then let's say we um, hit our first 4,000 of the um, market rate, we pull in the 20% affordable, we accomplish 802 of our affordable units. That leaves us still with 2,000, uh, uh, let's see, no, I'm sorry, that, that leaves us with um, 1,956 of our affordable units still unbuilt. And, and we've used up our market rate and we've got the inclusionary we put out of that. Um, so the remaining affordable units at an estimated $750,000 a unit, I think that's kind of conservative. I've heard that in Pleasanton, the units cost actually more than that. We would need to be able to come up with funding about of about $1.5 billion. So I'll, some of that will come through various forms of tax credits and grants. And, and clearly we need to look at um, working with nonprofit builders and, and looking at projects of, instead of 20% affordable housing in the projects, much higher 50 and maybe even 100% projects because we're looking at still 2000 units to get built. <sighs> Um, I think we do in the, the staff report, it highlights that we do need to look at every possible avenue to bring reality back to the numbers that the state, the state is requiring. They are putting us in a position that they know we can't achieve. They know we don't have $1.5 billion dollars and they're not funding these mandates. And so we really do have to do everything that we can to bring a more reasonable um, uh, numbers back to this process. And so um, I have great faith in our, our staff and I know we're gonna get through the, the housing element process and um, I just, I think we're gonna, going. I, I completely support that we need to, I, I don't believe our crisis is in market rate housing. It is the affordable housing piece. Our last cycle, we built 200% of affordable and such a small percent of, affor, uh, of market rate, 200% of market rate and such a small percentage of the affordable. And really, we need to, in order to meet the real demand, focus on that affordability. So um, it's gonna be a, a tough process. I will second the motion. And um, I, I think as a community, we'll work together to do the best we can, but we need to push back on the state for setting us up for failure. That's it, thank you. Uh, Council Member Arkin, comments? Yes, thank you, Mayor Brown. Um, yeah, a lot of has already been said, but, you know, I think, that, you know, hopefully, hopefully there will be some sort of reevaluation of the RENA numbers. I think it, it's been said before with the COVID impacts and I, 
you hear every day, a lot of major companies in the Bay Area, especially, um, you know, going to full time work at home permanently. So that definitely should affect what the numbers for workforce housing in any community would be. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll get to see that. Um, and I think advocating for that is great, but you know, we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. Um, I am too very supportive of more affordable housing. We, we haven't done our piece in this, the last cycle. So that's not the question. We absolutely do need to do more. And I'm su very supportive of that. The funding piece is the big piece as council member Testa just said, excuse me, vice mayor Testa just said, um, you know, that's earlier I asked how much was in our affordable housing fund. It's $15 million and that's not gonna go very far for uh, the numbers that we have that we will have to uh, uh, zone for. So that's the issue. The, the funding um, that really the state should be helping with that. And there are advocacy efforts in that, in, in that area, but hopefully something will come to fruition on that. Um, and the impacts to infrastructure, like I've mentioned before, you know, I worry about the schools, what this is going to do to our school system. And that's definitely we have to keep in close talks with PUSD about how we go about this and keep them informed every step of the way. That's a very important piece. That's the number one reason why people move to Pleasanton is our schools. And we want to keep a high quality school system here, to keep people moving here and staying here. So, um, you know, the money for infrastructure, and that's not even counting the water, traffic, everything else. So those are important pieces that, um, Challenging task, no doubt. So um, with that, yes, I'm supportive of the uh, motion with uh, approving the consultants, absolutely. And um, I, I have confidence in our staff too, um, that they will do a great job and great outreach efforts, which I'm looking forward to and, uh, <clears throat> and explaining the whole process and everything to our community. So, thank you. Council Member Bulch, comments? Uh, yes, please, Mayor. So uh, I, appreciate the prior council members and vice mayor's comments because I think everyone uh, has demonstrated an, a knowledge of the challenge ahead. So uh, maybe, uh, uh, forgive me being the youngest in terms of this, but leadership is required and I'm confident uh, this group can do it. So I appreciate that. I think it's prudent to go ahead and appeal the numbers as staff has recommended. And I, I know we probably all feel that, but I remember watching the council meeting when it was 4,900 units and talking about the Zoom COVID impacts and Zoom towns and what the mobility of people were. So uh, I also believe, as council member Narm said, that if the numbers are, are larger or not, the process laid out by staff has uh, provided a framework for adapting to that in the future where we can scale back or uh, go forth. Um, so that's important. I also wanna mention as a planning commissioner, one of the things we started to deal with in, in the later years was this no net loss zoning. And I just wanna mention that that's gonna probably be a major game changer that I think we should not, um, I'm sure it will come forth, but the concept is, is if we do approve 30 per acre and it goes to 20 on building permit, that 10 unused needs to be found somewhere else. And I think that's going to be a significant challenge for us when we look at the sites previously identified, not only as Vice Mayor Testa mentioned about, can we reuse those sites or uh, Council Member Nara mentioned, can we reuse those sites, but, but also uh, the no net loss zoning uh, that comes with that, right? That I think will be a major challenge. The Planning Commission, back when I sat on it a couple of years ago, had presentations about higher density. And by the way, it was thinking 40, or so, because it was looking at when does a parking, underground parking become fiscally feasible or financially feasible in a project and still have high quality of design that doesn't then look like a, you know, a, a significantly large building. Uh, I watched a recent planning commission meeting where they asked to see designs up to, I believe uh, Ms. Clark can correct me, but 60 units because they're thinking density as well, both where it can go and, and what it can look like. So just maybe wrapping up, no matter what the numbers are, I really do believe we need to plan now, begin planning now, giddy up, as I said, to preserve the character of our community while truly adapting to the challenges we face ahead. Um, 
I think we all want to achieve the best results for Pleasanton. And the best results, I think, will take time to distill out uh, location, the type of product, minimizing the impact, water. I mean, we, we've mentioned it all. Um, I really, really think community outreach and community education and input are going to uh, generate the best results for Pleasanton. And I really hope we, uh, all five of us, plus the staff work to do that. I think Becky Dennis's letter about finding solutions to our own housing problems, including workforce, teachers, vets, um, public employees, all important. Preventing unnecessary sprawl, she mentioned, I think also important. Minimizing impacts to our neighborhoods and community um, and then truly eyes on school circulation uh, infrastructure and the environment. Um, I wanna mention it's gonna be up to probably this council to set Pleasanton on the path of growing gracefully. So that's my goal and I will extend any support to any of you, my fellow uh, electeds here to, to do that in any way I can. And then lastly, just because I do know uh, the city staff a little bit, I uh, in reading the, the challenge ahead, wanna express my sincere appreciation to our city staff and our city commissioners who are going to help us through this process and guide us with it. Their collective breadth and depth of knowledge should not be understated. Coupled with their dedication to Pleasanton, I really am happy they're on our team as we begin this journey and walk us through it because I think this team is the team that can, can solve this widget for Pleasanton and I appreciate their time and help. Thank you. Great, right, thank you, Councilmember Member Balch. Uh, everybody here is just so uh, so tuned into the public. It's one of the advantages of being council members who and mayor who run for office and really do a lot of outreach. Uh, but uh, something I think it was council member Nair, oh council member Nair mentioned about um, a previous group is distributed all over town. I think that's extremely important. It helps the school district. It helps traffic, and it and it puts the burden of additional what traffic and, and um, you know, individuals and, and just development across the entire community, not all in one side. And I think that is really important. And of course, Jack, we all agree with you. We have incredible staff and uh, they're gonna do a terrific job for us. We are gonna meet our housing requirements and uh, we are going to uh, see if there's some way the numbers uh, could be rechecked and see if uh, those are correct because we're gonna do everything we can, but we also want to find out what the tolerance is or the appetite is for our community for all these additional homes. And uh, the state is, as we like to say so frequently, we like local control because we understand people that live near airports are very cranky because they don't like the people flying over the plains. We have limited parks, limited um, resources and the schools are already overcrowded and beyond our, um, general plan guidelines. So we're gonna meet our needs. We're going to do it with, with uh, a significant outreach to the public and hand in hand, we're gonna get through this and we're gonna get it done. But it, will, it is significant, it is going to be difficult and it is going to require a lot of collaboration uh, with our residents. So to that, I'll thank them in advance. I'm going to ask our city clerk to take a roll call vote, please. We have a motion made and seconded. Council members Naram. Yes. Testa. Yes. Arkin. Aye. Ball. Aye. Mayor Brown. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. 913, are we doing okay for our last item? It's good, all right. Um, local campaign finance options and review of the new state contribution limits uh, for existing uh, City of Pleasanton voluntary expenditure limits, agenda item 14. And I wondered if we could have a staff report, please. Yes. Council, I'll try to get my screen share working. And it's not. <laughs> Okay, let's try this. 
So campaign finance regulations are an issue for the council that you last checked in on in 2008. And the public interest in campaign finance regulation has to do with making sure that people who donate funds to candidates for office don't gain unfair access or influence over those officials who are elected. So balancing that public interest, courts often look at what are the First Amendment rights for freedom of speech and freedom of association. In terms of background, one of the pivotal pieces of law governing local campaign finance and elections is a Political Reform Act. And this is a regulation that was adopted by the voters in 1974 that limited contributions and also required disclosure of contributions received by candidates and also set up the Conflict of Interest Code. Other propositions were considered by voters at various times over the decades, and those have also been supplemented by state legislation and also campaign regulations adopted by local agencies, including various cities and counties. Locally here in the Tri-Valley, excuse me, one of the new state legislations that we're here to talk about with you tonight is AB 571. This was adopted in 2019 and went into effect as of July, excuse me, January 1st of this year. This imposes a limit on individual contributions for local elections. So these are people who are running for office at the city or county level. And I should be clear by individual contributions, we mean contributions by individual people, contributions by partnerships, companies, different kinds of businesses, also by associations, committees, or groups of people who act together. So the definition of individual is very broad. It's more than just one person. This new law sets a limit that's going to be adjusted regularly by the state's Fair Political Practices Commission. This is the state agency that was formed by the Political Reform Act that we just mentioned. For the next election cycle in 2021-2022, the limit on individual contributions is going to be $4,900. This law does state that a city or county may adopt a local limit which is higher or lower than the state amount. Locally, here in the Tri-Valley, Dublin adopted a contribution limit and in 2009, it increased that contribution limit to $500 per person. And their persons are the same definition under state law which includes businesses, committees, and different associations of people. We should also note that the city of Livermore previously had a campaign contribution limit, but they repealed that limit, which was $250 in 2017. I see a Clarissa, hand, Council Member Balch. Yes, yeah, so I apologize. Is your slide showing or is it just me that has a technical problem? Uh, I'm still on the entry slide. Okay, I'm not sure what people are seeing. I'm, uh, we're seeing yeah. yeah, we're seeing the very first slide and the second slide. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Because it's moving yeah, along you're for in me, so I was just moving along. I apologize. Let me try that again. I was following and it wasn't matching the slide, so I just wanted to make sure it wasn't hey, just my... Okay, there you does go. anyone see something now? Contribution yep. limits continued, yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Councilmember Balt. Everyone looked like they were nodding or following along. <laughs> so as I said, locally only Dublin has that contribution limit. Livermore had a limit that they repealed in 2017 and their limit was $250. And I also most recently checked based on a request and I would note that the city, the town of Danville and the city of San Ramon, neither of them have any contribution limits. So locally, it really is only Dublin. Here in Pleasanton, when we reviewed the campaign committee filing information, all of the contributions were below the new state limit of the $4,900. And I should note that contributions that individuals make to their own campaign are not subject to this limit. And that's the policy that because the concern is individual donors gaining unfair access to candidates who might be elected isn't implicated for an individual when they donate that money to their own campaign. 
I would note that the new state law, AB 571, does limit the amount an individual candidate can loan to their campaign, but at $100,000 as the limit, I don't think it's going to be implicated here in our community. I would note also this contribution limit of $4,900 does also apply to committees. So if a committee, for example, a political action committee, wants to give funds to a candidate, they are also subject to that $4,900 limit. So if the council wants to consider a contribution limit, they should provide, we'd ask you to provide staff with direction about whether you want it to be higher or lower than the state limit, and then we can come back and prepare an ordinance for your consideration at a subsequent meeting. I would note that by using the state law limit, the Fair Political Practices Commission will enforce that, will review committee statements and make sure people are in compliance. If the city adopts their own local limit, be it higher or lower, the city would need to either contract with the Fair Political Practices Commission for them to enforce or find some other method for enforcement. Now, another element of campaign regulation are expenditure limits. In 2008, the city of Pleasanton adopted a voluntary campaign expenditure limit, and that was set at $1, excuse me, $1 per registered voter plus an inflation factor. That $1 was considered appropriate for the cost of printing and mailing a postcard, so a way to outreach to voters. And the goal of having that limit was to have candidates engage voters in person and not rely heavily on mailers or advertising. I would note that there are no other Tri-Valley cities that have a local expenditure limit. I would also note that our expenditure limit is voluntary and without penalty. So if someone exceeds a limit, there is no penalty. And that's because courts have ruled that expenditure limits are subject to strict scrutiny because there's a strong concern that limiting expenditures restricts protected political speech. There's no government interest in making sure that everyone spends the same amount of money on their campaign. And the spending itself doesn't implicate corruption or access to candidates. It really is the receipt of contributions, which is regulated on another way. In terms of our voluntary contribution limit, in 20, for the 2020 campaign that you just had, the limit was $55,000. That was based on the fact that the city of Pleasanton had, in February of 2020, 45,723 registered voters and that was based on information available from the Alameda County Register of Voters, and that was, as the Municipal Code provides for, adjusted for inflation since 2008, and between the last 12 years, there was about 21% inflation. So that's how we reached that 55,000 number. I should note that all candidates for office agreed to abide by this limit, and no candidate exceeded that limit. So if the Council wants to consider or higher or lower voluntary expenditure limit, once again, staff would ask for direction and we would prepare an ordinance to amend the existing municipal code for your consideration at a subsequent meeting. So in conclusion, the council can consider higher or lower limits than the new state limit for contributions or higher or lower voluntary expenditure limits from the existing city expenditure limit. And then you can provide direction to us and we can return with an ordinance. So staff's available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. This item was um, raised under matters initiated by council member Arkin. So I'll go to council member Arkin. Uh, this is your item. Do you have any questions? Um, thank you, Mayor Brown. Um, the only question, so I did under matters initiated bring this, the voluntary expenditure limit one up, um, not the contribution limit, but um, the only question I have, I think, is under the contribution limit, if we were to go to, hypothetically, we, we did pick a different amount than the state $4,900 amount, um, and then we would be responsible for enforcing it by either contracting with FPPC, um, which I understand could be costly, or enforcing it on our own. Could you explain what enforcing on our own would be? Would we have to contract, contract with someone else? 
Do we do it in-house? Um, what would that look like? And what would be the financial impact of something like that? Well, the FPPC gave us a sample contract that they have with San Bernardino. And that contract required the payment of $55,000 at the beginning of an election cycle for them to enforce San Bernardino's local limit. But I did want to disclose there was a caveat in there that said if there had to be extensive enforcement and legal action that there could be additional costs related to that. So I think the concern would be for the city that if we didn't have an organization like the FPPC with that kind of expertise, there isn't staff resources that regularly handle campaign finance issues and wouldn't be able to unless we had dedicated people tracking these kinds of issues. As we indicated to you in the supplemental memo, it can get quite um, accounting specific in terms of if candidates have funds from a prior campaign and move it to a new election, there's going to be various accounting rules that have to be tracked and staff hasn't had to deal with those kinds of issues previously. So that would be sort of a new level of expertise that we don't have in-house. So that would, we would recommend if there was that interest to contract with the FPPC. And I'm not aware of other organizations that are available to provide that. Though I know you just spoke earlier in this meeting about hiring an auditing company. I'm not sure if there's auditing companies that are available for auditing local campaign finance ordinances. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think that's the only question I have right now. All right, um, Councilmember Balch. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I, I guess I don't know if I should spend a lot of time questioning the contribution limits uh, if, if maybe that's not where the direction of the council is going to go. So maybe I'll, I'll just do some brief ones there. So uh, Larissa, if I may ask, how does the $4,900 limit set by the state under this? Uh, I guess, let me, let me restart. That applies now to San Ramon, Danville, and these other municipalities that you said have no limits because now the state limit applies to all, correct? That's correct. And so like it, now thinking about uh, Dublin specifically with its $500 limit, it's gonna need to review its policy, I would think now in light of this new state law changes to whether to enforce itself or outsource enforcement or, or do something with it, correct? Yes, and I would assume that up until this point when Dublin has had this and it had started many years ago before they hit the 500 limit, I think they went from 125 to 250 to now 500, that they were always going to have to enforce that themselves. Okay. Uh, okay, and so then in reading the memo that you sent out just before the meeting now, the $4,900 odometer, right, the, the resetting of the clock, uh, so I, I apologize for ignorance, but I've been elected for a four-year term, right, uh, but they talk about per election. So does that, uh, maybe you can, can pontificate a little bit, does that apply for all four years that I'm here and it will apply for uh, the 20. 24, or does that apply for only the 22 for a sitting council member? Because we have obviously the mayor's every two, and I think it was written every two, correct? It's for each election. So to the extent that the mayor, the seat of the mayor is up, then people can donate up to 4,900 this cycle if we were having a mayoral election. And then there would potentially be an adjustment to that amount. So it might be 4,950 for the next cycle. And then that would be the cycle where there's both the mayor's seat and council member seats. And so all of those, but at the next mayor's election, there would be a certain number of council seats also. So those would also be subject to that limit. But if someone is not running and they're not going up to an election for four years, then they couldn't collect twice in both election cycles because they're not actually a candidate in that first one. So by default, that extends to a four-year collection period for a four-year term? Yes, because the person isn't running for an office until four years from then. So they would be, when they're looking to collect funds for the 23-24 election cycle, the FPCC would have a new amount at that time, and that would be their limit. 
I think I missed a little bit. So let me let me maybe rephrase and, and I apologize. And I understand we're asking you to interpret state law. So I'll, I'll be a little high brief. The mayor's seat is is every two years. And, and obviously the mayor just got elected. Congratulations, mayor. So uh, sh uh, taking it away from from our current mayor, the mayor's seat get, gets to raise forty nine hundred dollars for the current time leading up to the twenty to election, correct? Correct. The mayor then gets elected and now the mayor's gonna go for another election in 24. They get to raise another $4,900, correct? Correct, that's their new cycle for the next election cycle. But as we indicated, if that successful candidate didn't spend all the money they raised, then there will be an issue of how to assign the money that remains in the account uh -huh. against potential people who want to contribute a second time for the subsequent election. And then there would be some accounting of those folks. And FIFO, the FIFO, the LIFO contributor thing that you mentioned. Okay. And so, yeah. so taking that information we just presented, so a council member seat is every four years. So if they receive a contribution of $2,500, the first two year period, and then a second contribution of $2,500 in the second two year period, that would probably be a problem because obviously that adds up to five versus the 49. That's correct. So they would have to refuse a hundred or it might turn out by the time the 24 election happens, there has been an adjustment and it might be closer to five than 49. And then just to make things continuously interesting, uh, political action committee money and independent expenditures. Uh, it's my understanding the Supreme Court has ruled that that cannot be limited. Is that correct? On what they can- Contributions to those organizations, those committees can't be limited, but what those committees can contribute to individual candidates is limited by this 4,900 limit. But then they so could they go wanted to give money to the candidate, they're subject to the limit. But if they wanted to independently spend the money, they're not subject to the limit in terms of contributions they receive from other people. Okay. So, so, okay. So then they um, apologize for the nuance. Uh, it's like a, a little bit of legal advice. So at if, if an independent expenditure group wanted to go spend uh, $5,000 on a, on a media blitz outside of the candidate without any uh, coordination or whatnot, right? So that they truly meet the independent expenditure. They could so do it. They could so do it. Disclosure accordingly, but they could do that. That's correct. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask now to the voluntary uh, expenditure limit or spending limit. So if an off, if someone gets elected to a city council position with a four year term uh, and they have excess funds, it's my understanding they could use excess funds as uh, office holder uh, expenses, um, whatever those may be, mailers, phone calls, et cetera. Uh, are those then subject and accounting to if they were to go for re-election into their voluntary expenditure limit if they redesignate their account? I guess it's a double it's a double question. So I'll I'll take that one offline. I'll retract. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No further questions. Council Member Naran, any questions for staff? Yeah, I want to follow up on Council Member Balchus. Uh, question on the election cycle. So, Larissa, I think I heard you say that, you know, in the case of a mayor running the, in our, in, for our election, it would be uh, from January 1, 2021 through uh, the year 2022, that would be subject to a $4,900 campaign contribution limit from an individual donor, as you defined. That's correct. And and then for council members, so for let's say council member Bulch, not to pick on him, but he is his donors are subject to that forty nine hundred dollar limit from the period of January 1, 2021 
all the way through 2024 when he would be up for, he would have been up for re-election. That's correct. Okay. Because he's not running for an office in between, so he only has one election that he can raise the funds for. So then taking that to the uh, voluntary expenditure limit, would that, those two scenarios um, apply to that where, again, in his case, he would uh, be able, if he committed to the voluntary spending limit, he would have 55,000 from January, roughly 55,000 from January 1 of 2021 through 2024? Or is in that 20... separate? And, I'm sorry, and up to us? In 2024, at 150 days before the November 2024 election, we would take a look at the number of registered voters, and based on our existing code, we make the adjustment for the inflation adjustment, and so that's how we would reach the voluntary expenditure limit for the November 2024 election. So if we continue to have increases in the number of registered voters plus the inflation adjustment, we would expect that number to increase. But is and that, that pledge is signed at the time where the candidate takes out um, files their intention papers. So between January 1st of 2021 and when he would go pull his re-election papers, he could spend whatever he chose in support of his, um, his, his, his position. In other words, if he wanted to do mailers to his constituents or whatever, he would not be limited in what he could spend, he's limited on how much he can raise that because of being subject to the $4,900 individual contribution. If the council wanted to be more clear about that, because if he was raising the funds for his election, so if he started to raise funds for his election for city council in 2024, that could start counting against the expenditure limit but it's just the actual final number of the expenditure limit isn't set until early 2024. So to the extent that his campaign statements track the expenditures, then that could be counted against that voluntary limit. Reaching so, all the way back to January of 21? Right, if you're using campaign funds that are being raised and designated for election 2024. Okay, so is that something, I mean, is that something that we would specify or is that already part of the voluntary spending limit? If that's something that the council wants to clarify, we can do that to be very specific about when you want that clock to start. Okay. No, we don't do that now. It's well, I don't think it's been a problem yet, but the forms do accumulate expenses for campaigns. And when we looked at those forms, there weren't any that exceeded the voluntary expenditure cap. But don't the forms only um, uh, accumulate them for the year? And so when you go to the next year, doesn't, don't the, doesn't that reporting um, start over in terms of the amount raised and the amount spent? I would have to review the forms again. I have to say, I only looked at the forms for 2020, so I didn't accumulate with the 2019 forms. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they don't, they roll over every year as a former treasurer. Um, okay. Um, and- Council member, Narum, Council member Narum, uh, notwithstanding the, maybe the partial confusion about um, when the clock starts, uh, <clears throat> That was not the intention when the voluntary expenditure limit was created. It was it was meant to be prospective um, uh, when set for the purposes of calculating expenditures during the campaign to to come, not not the campaign activity leading up to the campaign. So to Larissa's point, you can make that change, but that that wasn't the genesis of the, the well, original. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that clarification, Nelson. Um, Larissa, has are you aware? Has a maybe this would be for Karen Diaz? Has a candidate ever declined 
uh, the voluntary expenditure limit since it's been in place? Honestly, I would have to defer to Karen. All I know is for the last 2020 campaign, all 12 candidates signed the pledge and nobody exceeded the limit. And this is Karen. So since 2008, when the ordinance was enacted, every candidate has taken the pledge. So I didn't catch all you, that. I'm you, sorry. You dropped out, Karen. I'm sorry. So every candidate since 2008, when the ordinance was enacted, has taken the pledge. Okay, thank you. And did anybody exceed the pledge? Nobody has ever exceeded the pledge. Okay. All right. I think that's my questions for now. Thank you. Yeah, no one exceeded the pledge because it's a big number. All right, uh, Vice Mayor Testa. Okay. Um, so just for clarification, what we currently have is a voluntary expenditure limit. Everyone has always um, signed the pledge and there's never been enforcement, but it's been, I know the first time uh, it was introduced to me, the description was a gentleman's agreement. So a gentle person's agreement um, without enforcement, but it's, it's worked because we expect that a candidate for, for office in Pleasanton will be ethical and follow that agreement, correct? That's what we currently have, no enforcement and it's worked. That's correct, because it is voluntary. Right. Um, and I will, I will absolutely, I have always objected to sign, signing the pledge because I felt that it was absurdly high. And I've, I've signed it because I knew that it would be misconstrued, but I think it's absurdly high the way it is right now. Um, and I, the contribution, um, I think we, the nearly 5,000 on a contribution limit, I think is also absurdly high. So I would hope that we would have some discussion and ask that um, we revisit and ask for a future staff report to revisit that. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. We started with Valerie, so we've gone through the circle. Um, Larissa, I have a few questions. When I read your listing on um, the staff report for the Dublin, I guess it was the amendment supplement um, for Dublin, I didn't see PAC donations and I was looking for that. So there's a lot of limited liability companies, committees, but specifically this would be a donation from a political action committee to a candidate. And if there's a limit that's put in this case for Dublin, $500. Um, but we can limit that, right? I mean, it's it's a donation received, whether it's $4,900 or in their case, $500. Dublin's definition also used the same definition of person that the state law uses, so it would include a committee like a political action committee. So that right. would be subject to the 500 limit that the committee could give to the candidate. But as we've discussed earlier, then the committee, if it's acting independently, can spend independently of the Certainly. candidate. Absolutely, can spend independently. But I just want to make sure, because there are some political action committees that donate to candidates directly without expenditures other than that. And um, what about a donation that, let's say we set a limit like Dublin's for $500 and a husband donates $500. A wife donates $500, a child donates $500, the other child donates five. dollars How do you, any ideas how you can, it, it, that's abusing the concept in my mind. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not by an individual, it's by a household and they're trying to take a loophole and make multiple donations from different family members. Is that something that could be controlled easily? I would think the only concern would be if we have underage children who are shown as donors when they don't actually have their own source of income, then you could assume that that means that the parents are reimbursing them. And so then that means the parents are making a double donation. 
you know, when a husband and wife or two adults in the same household support the same candidate, that either could mean that there's a spirited discussion at the dinner table or they share the same views. Um, so it's for individuals, not for households, because I think that pract for practical purposes, that would be very hard to enforce to decide who's a household and then limiting that. And that would probably face a legal challenge in terms of people's ability for their freedom of association if they both want to politically associate with that candidate and they're both as adults making their own income meeting that limit of if you're discussing $500. Okay. Um, you and I spoke earlier about that first in first or last in first out, I guess it was LIFO um, contribution. So I have, uh, let's say I'm a candidate and I have some money I didn't spend and I'm getting ready to go into the next cycle, whether it's two years or four years. Um, how do I account if that money that I have left over was received prior to my election? So it's not that January, 2021, but I'll just pick a number and say I have $5,000 to carry forward for the future election. Is that still first in, first out? Because I received it before the election date. Uh, with regard to that, I've been looking at the Fair Political Practices fact sheets to try to understand the direction they're giving to local candidates about how to treat funds that were received before January 1st, 2021. So I think as we get that clarification, we'll figure out if that those funds before the effective date of the law need to be attributed or if they don't need to be attributed and that is effectively in the committee and isn't counting against the next $4,900 limit. Perfect, thank you. The other kind of wrinkle is I, I run for city council and then I have a little bit of money and now I'm running for a different office. So now I'm running for mayor. So does that money that maybe I was received after 2021 um, Obviously, I'm already, but let's just say I was a council member now, and I'm going to take my little pile of money, and I'm going to run for a different office. Does that still apply that that those funds after January 2021, even though it's a different office? It does. The new regulation does say that moving campaign funds from one controlled committee to a controlled committee for city elective office for the same candidate. So what they're tracking is the candidate not the actual office they're running for. So if you moved it from a council committee to a mayoral committee, it would count if those funds were received after January 1, 2021. We oftentimes change committee names because uh, I've been like Carla Brown 2016 and then somebody 2020. So it's a different name, but it's still the same candidate. So thank you, that Correct. helps. And that's what the regulation, the new state law tracks the candidate, not the name of the committee or the okay. office. There was a question about parties. Let's see. And it was uh, the, 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 the. somebody can throw. Here we go. It's a, a um, six on the addendum that you added. If individuals spend money to promote a candidate, but do not coordinate with that candidate, what are those individuals reporting requirements? So let's say I want to throw a party for a candidate and I don't invite the candidate. So they did not coordinate with the candidate. I could still invite them, but I could throw a party up to a thousand dollars and nobody has to report it. That seems a lot of money that could support a candidate. Um, but maybe the candidate just uh, wasn't coordinated with the is that, am I understanding that correctly? So if, if a, a, a committee of people or an individual can spend up to $1,000, up to 1000 to support a candidate or oppose a candidate, and then they aren't subject to the reporting requirements under state law. So whether it's funds needed to rent a hall and pay for food, or whether it's funds needed to buy an advertisement in a local paper, as long as it's under that $1,000 limit for the whole election cycle, then they aren't required to report. And that's the state law threshold, the $1,000. Now, you don't have to register as a PAC. Because it's under 1,000. It's under 1,000. So 
I want Lori. But if they raised 1500 and spent under 1000 because they've raised that much, then they need to report. Oh, this is an expenditure, not a raising. So that now you just added a new wrinkle. So I throw a party and I get $1,000 worth of income in for the candidate. They're obviously going to report that because now those are checks made out to the candidate. But if I write if that a, was if that was directly to the candidate, yes. But oh. if it's directly to the committee and it's not in coordination with the candidate, that threshold is two thousand for raising money. Expending money, the threshold is a thousand. Sneaky way to raise money. Okay. All right. I think that is all I have for questions. Let me take one quick look. All right, um, so we've asked all the way circle around. Uh, clerk, do we, uh, I'd like to open the public hearing. Do we have anyone that would like to speak on this item? We have no speakers for this item. Boy, it's complicated. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna go back to Valerie Ark and start back to the circle at top. Um, Valerie, we're looking for some feedback so she can, so Larissa can craft an ordinance. Um, would you like to start? Sure, thank you. So um, I'm gonna talk about the, the one that I requested that it be brought forward, which is the voluntary expenditure limit. So that was my request under matters initiated. And you know, when I ran um, for my city council seat, and I, I must tell you when I saw that, <laughs> when I saw that number, I, I, surprise doesn't even cut it. Um, that number to me is astronomical to run for a city council seat in Pleasanton, California. Um, and I think, and I know it's voluntary um, and stay voluntary, of course. I, I don't have a problem with that. Any candidate could decide not to sign it. I really did not want to sign it because I thought about the message that it sent and I didn't want to agree to it. But just as Vice Mayor Testa said, I thought really long and hard about it. I really wasn't going to sign it. Um, but I thought if I didn't sign it, then that would imply to people that I planned on spending more than 55000 and I didn't want that to come across. So reluctantly, I signed it. Um, but I think my problem with it is, the, again, the message it is sending. So anybody that wants to run for office here in Pleasanton as a, for city council, they see that number. And even though it is voluntary, a number of that magnitude to me would tell a person if, if I were, you know, doing that and I, you could think that I need to get close to that amount to win a seat. And I think with, you know, it eliminates people that may not have the funds because they may think they have to use personal funds. So now it's becoming an equity issue to me. Um, and... I just, it, it's, it, it's a hard, it, you know, it, it just, I, 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 that's what I have the issue with. So, and 55,000 in our staff report, it says um, the intent was to encourage candidates to engage with voters and not rely on mass mailings or advertising. Um, I don't honestly know what you would spend $55,000 on if you aren't doing mass mailers or advertising. I, I really have no idea. I spent $6,200 on my campaign and I won first place out of seven. So, I, and I, it's not to take away from the fact that I, I've been in this community a long time and I've been involved for a long time. So not to take away any of that, but I only spent $6,200. And, um, you know, and I will say it wasn't even easy to raise $6,200 for me because a lot of my donations are very, were very small donations from residents here. So, uh, you know, trying to get somebody that wants to rely on donations from individuals here of $25, $50, even $100 to get to any amount close to 50 grand, uh, you know, that's a lot of donations. And that I think, I think unnecessarily so will have people reconsider and not want to run. And I think that could, you know, there's good people that may want to run and that could prohibit them from running. So that's kind of why I brought this whole, um, this whole issue up. Um, 
I think it should definitely, um, it should definitely be the voluntary expenditure limit. Again, still voluntary. I would like to see it lower and perhaps have a different amount for city council versus mayor, which I think we could do. I understand the mayor race does take additional funds and I, 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 I don't, I, I wouldn't argue with that. So um, those are kind of my thoughts on it. And that's why I wanted to have an agenda item on it. You have some numbers in mind that you'd like to throw out for these limits for two different categories. I would suggest a limit of 15,000 for city council and 25,000 for mayor. Before I, the, what, before I go to the next person, what about individual contributions? We spent a lot of time about the 4,900. Were you thinking there's a limit on the individual contributions? You know, I would, I would like to see a limit on that. Um, I do have some concerns though with how we enforce it and that sort of thing. So I know Vice Mayor Testa asked that maybe that one be brought back. I think we might need a little more information on that. Um, I don't know. I'm a little more mixed on that one because of, of that. I think the number should be lower, to be honest, but I also think um, we have to weigh that with um, the enforcement issue. Having FPPC enforce it and us pay $50,000 a year just doesn't make sense to me. Um, so this would be a a city enforcement. So I think we'd need a little more, maybe a little more information on what that would look like. Maybe, I don't know, I'm throwing that out there. Done. Okay, um, Council Member Balch, any co comments, thoughts, giving direction? Well, the challenge I have is that when I signed the paper, uh, it's already pretty daunting to be willing to run for office. So the fact that we're departing from what the state would already be imposing and the new contribution limits um, now coming upon us, I feel like we're actually disenfranchising potential uh, people from running by having a local change. Um, that being said, I understand the concept of a dollar per voter, I do. Uh, I will mention that in a COVID year, uh, it is not simple, right? I was not able to go out and knock on your door. And if I did, you probably sprayed me with a garden hose and told me to go away. So the reality is, is it that you cannot part, um, foresee all of the challenges a candidate may have. So uh, as I think about it, um, we do have challenges, right? We want our, our process to be transparent and open, which is why they, uh, excuse me, by why council member Arkin and Testa both mentioned their concern about signing the pledge. To me, it sounds like that's a disclosure challenge that we should be really looking at. I think a different path forward to possibly achieving the goals that council member Arkin wants might be to look at uh, having accurate and timely uh, disclosure filings. There were several when I was preparing for the meeting tonight that are still not yet filed from the 2020 election. So we have other challenges associated with uh, transparency for our electorate. And uh, so no one's hit the limit. Uh, maybe the limit can reset to a dollar per voter at today's voter and, and take out the, the inflationary number. Maybe we could do something more like that. Um, but if transparency is our goal, in a COVID world, it's pretty hard to reach the voters at $15,000. And I think what Council Member Arkin is unfortunately uh, attributing her success to is, is just the money, but there are so many other non-monetary things she had, including being elected at another body. I came in being a, the only non-elected on this group, having no name recognition, and so we really are disenfranchising, uh, in a, in, at least in a COVID world, me. So I, uh, I think transparency can be achieved through timely and accurate candidate disclosure statements. I think we should consider trying to figure out what that could be. Uh, I worry about the $4,900 touching it. It seems like every way you would go with that would start to create a legal challenge one way or another. And I really think that we don't wanna incur the 
Uh, I mean, we would be willing to, but just to incur the expense of doing that, I think we let to, let's see what the FPPC will do. Let's it's the first year contribution limits are going to be imposed upon our city. Let's see what results from it. I'm not sure what problem we're trying to solve today. Um, if it's just because the number's scary, well, imagine looking at the increased regulation uh, as a basic accountant, right? We want people to run for office. We want people to step up. Every rule we make is an additional one to the one they already are going to have to go through for this state. So uh, I'm not sure I'm able to support where Councilman Arkin's going. I appreciate her candor in it though. Okay. I don't want to cut you off. I just want to make sure. Okay, he's on mute now. <laughs> I just want to be sure. All right, uh, Council Member Naram. Thank you. You know, I I think we have to to think about um, you know when these rules were enacted. <clears throat> excuse me. I believe back in two thousand and eight, and my recollection was that. Um, you know, we were, we were trying to have the disclosure, the transparency, and then let the people decide. <clears throat> you know, and there were a number of things that were done that we haven't even touched on um, from having to um, disclose a donation or an expenditure of $25 versus the state is 100. Uh, we've got the extra filing period. And I believe we were the first city to have the Forms 460, which is the campaign disclosure, put online so that it was instantaneous. It wasn't mailing it down to Oakland and not having it get posted till you know three or four days after the filing deadline. And so I think we need to kind of keep some of that in mind. I, you know, in terms of the voluntary expenditure, fifty-five thousand dollars is a lot of money. I would support going back, resetting it to a dollar per voter, but I think. You know, let's look at the last election. We had three people who were not on commissions and things step up, sign the pledge, and run. You know, it, when they went and showed up, it didn't, it wasn't a deterrent to them. And so I think I worry that we read more into this. I think if somebody's gonna run, they're gonna run and recognize that it's it's a voluntary um. Uh, a limit, you know, in terms of the, the contribution. So this is the first time that we're going to have a campaign contribution limit. I think we need to sit, stay at the 4,900. We need to see how it works. And I, I just, I just, I can't, I have a really tough time signing a contract for $55,000 with the FPPC and knowing that it could go higher uh, if we get into enforcement or, you know, um, challenges and things, I, I just, I can't see spending that kind of money, particularly when this is a new thing. I mean, if we get into it and we feel like it's being abused or we don't like it, we can always come back and set lower limits. Um, but I think we need to give it a try. I think it's a, otherwise I, I think I, I just question using, um, money that way. Um, I think it's also important to remember that the $4,900 in the case of council candidates covers four years. It doesn't cover one year unless you're a new candidate, but for, you know, the incumbents, it's, it's $4,900 per four year cycle. So I think that's something that also needs to, to keep, keep in mind. Um, but I think one of the things that bothers me too about um, trying to limit it or limit the voluntary contributions, I mean, you're really kind of stacking it in favor of an incumbent like us because somebody coming in who, who from, you know, who's running for the first time, they're probably not going to have name recognition. You know, they're probably going to be trying to figure out ways to get their name out. And if if you really limit things, I think you're really um, doing a disservice to the to the challenger and slanting things to in favor of the incumbent. And I, 
I don't think that's right either. You know, I think the other thing, there's recognition about the, um, the incumbents. I mean, you know, one of the things is that the mayor cannot do uh, the mayor's report from the point that they file papers to the election so that there isn't a dis, you know, there's not a disadvantage of that extra um, publicity. And I, I, you know, I just think we need to keep things like that in mind. Um, I also think it's really important to look at what happened in Livermore. They set campaign limits and they went on their way and then they started having um, independent expenditures. I believe in one case, uh, an independent expenditure committee spent $70,000 um, in an election and the candidates uh, realized that, that at 250 or whatever their limit was, they didn't have enough money or they couldn't raise enough money to be able to counter that. And so they got rid of their, um, their limits uh, so that they could, could be in a position to try to counter independent um, expenditures that might be against them. So I, I, you know, I think we just need to be really careful here and we need to give the $4,900 um, a try. It can always be changed. And as I said, I would support resetting the, the voluntary expenditure limit to a dollar a voter, um, but I don't support the 15,000 for a council candidate. So those would be my comments. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Testa, what do you think? We all know how toxic money and politics are. We know at so many levels how money is the problem with politics. I've been disenchanted over these last couple of years at seeing how money influences things with our state level politicians. Um, I absolutely support sending a message, setting an example, and limiting both our contributions and expenditures. Um, I've never spent more than $6,000 on a campaign. My last campaign um, was right around $6,000, I think. I, I can't remember if it was a little under or a little over, but um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't even imagine. In fact, my towards the end of the campaign, when I recognized that I had spent everything, everything was paid for. People who tried to that offered me actually handed handed me checks. I handed them back because I no longer needed anything more. And I, I just think for a a city council campaign at our level, the kind of money that has been spent is, I, 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 I think it's unnecessary and um, I would really like to send the message. I think it, everything should be voluntary. I don't think we have to worry about enforcement. I think that if someone chooses to, um, violate the voluntary agreements, it's going to backfire on them. They will be, I don't think Pleasanton would support someone who did that. I think it would cause them more harm than good. Um, I think we should all move forward with all the um, best intentions. And um, so, what problem are we trying to solve? I, I'll tell you, when, when somebody was giving me $100, I wanted to know that, and I wanted them to know that that money was going to be judiciously spent and that I would use it the same as I would my own money. And with that in mind, I, I couldn't imagine needing more than $15,000, but I would be willing to suggest that we look at 50 cents per voter, which is over the 15,000, but um, I could go with the 15,000 also. 
But the most I would think is reasonable is a voluntary expenditure of 50 cents per voter. When I, for both um, council member Arkin and myself, when I calculate how much I spent per vote received, I feel proud of that. I know that Valerie does also. And I was not an incumbent. I was not a, a prior elected. Um, I wasn't a planning commissioner. I was not, I did not have the name recognition of someone who was lifetime Pleasanton, although I had, was proud to have been longtime Pleasanton. I, incumbents will always have an advantage. Um, that's not even a, uh, an argument that, that factors in. Um, but I think setting voluntary limits of reasonable amounts of expenditures and contributions does level the playing field. And I would, I would like to see a contribution limit of $1,000, but I'd I'd be willing to say it's reasonable to say $2,000 on a campaign contribution limit. Again, voluntary. I don't think we have to look at enforcement. If at some point it really does get that ugly, well, then shame on us, I guess. Um, so I would hope that we would ask staff to look at voluntary um, campaign contributions and limits. Um, and set an example of take the ugly money out of politics. That's it. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah, after running very low budget campaigns and this last one was more expensive, uh, I was often asked, what's your campaign limit? And I told people right less than they were willing to offer because I didn't want this big number to look um, like there was a bias to it. But I'd like to get keep big money out of office. Um, I think residents, I'm very proud of the $25 checks. I've even got $5 checks and very proud of those because that's what that person could afford, right? That's what they felt comfortable. But uh, I know Many of you who ran for office, including myself, spent a lot of money in newspaper ads because in COVID times, we did have to be more creative. You're absolutely right, Council Member Balch, we uh, couldn't knock on doors. And even being at the park or farmer's market near the park was uh, with distances, with masks, with you know elbow bumps, if that. So it was a very un, um, challenging campaign. But uh, it was still, I know I spent plenty of money on it and it was still expensive. And uh, I, I would like to bring the numbers down also. $4,900 is a big number. Um, it's a very big number. And when you're looking at limits, even up to 45,000, uh, that's one ninth of your number. That's a big number. So that's a, a large contribution. So like me, I walked a lot of doors. I walked door hangers. I know many of you did as well. We didn't knock on doors. We didn't uh, hardly <laughs> try to stay away from people. <laughs> it's like, the, do the door hanger and then go, walk away to keep your distance so everybody felt safe. But uh, I'd like to see a um, 1525 number. That's kind of the number that was coming to my mind too. It's easy to run a campaign for 15,000. Oh, a comment that was made about incumbents having a benefit? Absolutely they do. All the emails we all send back, all the emails that we show that we're following up and we care and we're somebody that, that listens to residents, they do. And that's why there's term limits because incumbents have a big benefit. So absolutely, um, if you do your job right, if otherwise incumbents have a disadvantage. So uh, I'd like to see a number in the 15 and 25 number, 15 for council and 25 for or mayors that makes sense to me, uh, whether it's 1,000 or 2,000, I don't really mind either one. And uh, I think we should all, if you're gonna run for office, we should be able to trust you to stay in these numbers and make the commitment to your community that you're going to do this within your budget. 
it's a little complicated. The money that's carried over, that's why we had a long discussion on it. Uh, when that, and I hope staff will bring back a little more clarity on that. Um, when you had a donation from a previous election, and would that person still be in this 1,000 or 2,000 number going forward? Um, that, that, that'll have to be really clear to candidates because we don't want anybody to accidentally make a mistake and be shamed for it. Um, so it sounds like you've got a split option. Um, we can go back around and talk one more time if you want to. And then maybe, Larissa, we can bring back a choice for people to vote on uh, if you but wanted to do that. We would, we would ask that you give us more specific direction in terms of the voluntary uh, expenditure limit in the form of a motion. Um, I'm, I'm hearing 15 and 25, um, and we can bring the details of that in an ordinance. Um, and then the second piece is what you would like to do in regards to either a mandatory um, uh, contribution limit, or I also heard a voluntary contribution limit, which um, I, I would guess means that we would default to the state number um, as the upper threshold, but have a voluntary contribution of a lower amount, um, much like uh, we have a voluntary expenditure limit uh, that candidates would sign. So if you can frame that in a motion, that will make the next process very more efficient for the council when we bring back the ordinance. Thank you, sort of give an option so people could vote one more time. But um, so going back around, a council member Arkin, uh, are you able to frame your voluntary expenditure limit? And if you want to add it, a voluntary contribution limit or mandatory contribution limit, but it would be um, on your good faith. I guess that would be an option. <laughs> I guess it wouldn't, be, if, if there was no penalty, I guess it's just on your, on okay. your through promise. The, through the mayor, I would like to clarify that the Fair Political Practices Commission has said under AB 7, under AB 571, if the city's contribution limit is voluntary and not mandatory, then the state limits will apply. So what Mr. Fialo indicated was if there's a voluntary contribution limit at a lower amount, that would be voluntary, but then the state higher amount would still be the ceiling where actual enforcement would occur at the state level. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Arkin. Okay, so I'll, I'll make a motion and then I'll comment after that. I would move that we have a ordinance with a voluntary contribution limit of $1,000 and a voluntary, again voluntary, expenditure limit of 15000 for a city council um, election and 25000 for the mayor race. Um, so that's my motion and I would, you know, I just wanted to kind of comment again on kind of what has already been, what, you know, kind of counter what has just been said. Um, yes, campaigning during COVID times was challenging. I think we all realize that, every candidate out there realized that, but we were all in the same boat with the COVID challenges. We all had to, that was an equal thing amongst all candidates. We all had the challenges of COVID and campaigning for an office. So I, I don't think that really, to me, has any bearing on, on what we're doing. Um, and yeah, the favoring of somebody that's an incumbent or well-known. You know, my first school board race, which was my first election, I spent $2,400 on that and came in second out of six or seven. Um, so it, it can be done even when you're not well known and haven't had an elected office before. And um, again, I, this is voluntary. So somebody doesn't have to sign it and there's no ramifications for not signing it. So um, the, I did check the Alameda County um, Registrar of Voters and at the last election in November, there were 48,000 voters in Pleasanton. 
So if we were to do, you know, a dollar, a dollar per voter without the inflation, what today's number would be $48,000. And to me, that's not much different than 55. So to me, that's not really, that's, that, that doesn't really cut it for me. So, um, you know, I think campaign finance reform is a really big issue nationally, statewide, and locally. And yes, we're not going to solve that whole problem um, with, with what we're deciding here, of course. But in my mind, it's a little step in the right direction on the whole money and politics issue, which to me is a very important issue. So, um, so that's my motion. And um, that's all I have to say. That's all. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to jump over to Vice Mayor Testa because I think you're both on similar mindset. So go ahead, uh, Julie. Okay. <clears throat> um, I'll second that motion and um, absolutely support everything that um, Council Member Arkin was saying. Um, can I just get clarification on the voluntary contribution versus the state? Is it, if we called it a maximum or if we, if we identified it differently, would it have more substance or it's going to be um, just a saying please and then the state limit is still the well, I think we would, we would frame it much the same way you experienced on the voluntary expenditure limit. Uh, as, as, as people come in to pull papers, uh, we, would, we would prepare paperwork and, and uh, uh, offer that up as a voluntary contribution. Gen limit. Gentle persons agreement, the same uh, kind of thing. Yes, 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 same thing. And then, and then to your point, um, if if a candidate chooses not to uh, sign that, then the state number would default, uh, and and if there are any violations on that front, the FPPC uh, would would enforce. Uh, there would be no out of pocket expenses from the city of Pleasanton for that activity. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I second that motion. Member Balch. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. So um, I actually take issue to the fact that there's a statement that we're in the same boat on COVID. I, I was not an elected official. I did not have a central committee. I did not have, uh, I am a registered independent. So I did not have the same non-monetary contributions being, uh, coming forward nor name recognition despite living in the city proximity for my entire life. So I, I don't believe that. Um, that being said, right, we're talking about the numbers proposed are less than a stamp for the number of voters we have in town. Furthermore, we just talked about adding 6,000 more units possibly 12,000 more uh, residents and no uh, conversation about inflation or any actual education or getting out uh, the vote type of element by a candidate. There's a lot at play. And uh, Vice Mayor Testa spent $7,800 in her election. I just looked up her form F460. So when we look at this, I think we need to be looking at disclosure transparency. I think we need to be looking at uh, the number of violations of disclosure statements. So for me, I would probably prefer more of a menu of options with the legal uh, implications of it. Because the legal implications of doing this, are we legal? What is it gonna mean? I think things need to be fully vetted. The other thing that we're not even talking about is, is the thousand dollars limit to the individual candidate. Can the candidate only contribute a thousand dollars to their campaign or are they able to not? Because I still have a loan against mine because I judiciously used the money given to me to 
work uh, and, and try to be elected. I didn't squander it or sit on it. And many of the people have balances that they are dealing with that are almost as much as the amount we're talking about here. So when I think of what we should be doing to help transparency in our city government process, we should not be uh, giving the incumbents an advantage. And having incumbents with a war chest that they can roll over and use is not the intent, I would think, of, of transparent government. We should be trying to make it so people want to step up and can raise funds. Maybe it isn't the dollar per voter. I'm not arguing one way or another, but I don't think the basis that is being presented is any more defensible than a different number. It's all arbitrary. But what's not arbitrary is transparency and disclosure. So I... I know there's a motion. I don't want to just keep making substitute motions, but I would rather see a menu of options with the legal ramifications of each, including maybe having the city council, uh, city manager and team bring back a list of all the uh, disclosures and the violations. End of your comments. Yeah, I can't think of anything else at this time. It's too late. <laughs> I want to cut you off. Uh, Council Member Naram. Yeah, so I can't support this. I, I would ask you to really stop and think about what you're doing. So it's great to talk about a voluntary spending limit and to say, well, it's voluntary. But who's going to not want to sign up for that and then get beat up in the press letters to the editor? So if you have limits like this, what are you doing? Ask yourself. There's nothing stopping the people that want to donate to pushing the money out to political action committees, spending it on their own independently. They can do $1,000 that can buy them a sticker that can buy, you know, a whole lot of things. And all you've done is you're pushing away from the transparency and the disclosures of who's funding the candidates themselves. And I, I just feel so strongly that this is the wrong way to go. We are a town of what, 80,000 people, 48,000 voters, $15,000 is, that's 25 cents a voter. I mean, let's think about that. You know, and I, I would say to council member Arkin, that's great that you spent $6,200, but you had been on the school board for 12 years. You had the democratic uh, committee, you know, dropping a door hanger with your name on it. And, you know, you had some advantages and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not, that's fine. But, but not everybody's going to have that. And so I just, I ask you to really think about, do you want to drive funding out to political action committees and independent expenditures? Is that really in the best interest of transparency, disclosure, and good government. For me, it's not. I think it's much more important to see what's associated with the candidate themselves via their 460s. And we even have an extra uh, reporting period in there from what the state requires. So I I'm sorry, I just, I can't support this. And um, I just feel so strongly that, that this is headed the wrong direction. So I'll leave it at that. All right. Well, I am really happy that we have 460s online and uh, I heard the word transparency, but to me, that's very transparent. I've looked up other PACs, I've looked up candidates and, um, and to find out where contributions are coming from. And it tells you a lot about that candidate. And uh, I actually I'd like to see some reporting. So job titles were actually correct. Um, that, that's really sloppy, but that's another issue. Uh, I too am a no party preference. Nobody walked neighborhoods. I ran against people that did have party preferences and some that didn't. Uh, I'm not sure that makes a huge difference, but we're all different. We all have different backgrounds we bring to this job. Um, I think it's time to get big money out of Pleasanton's government offices and uh, I respect everybody I serve with. You all worked hard to run for office. You're compassionate. I said it during the mayor's state of the city uh, address and I have the most respect for each and every one of you. 
but we all do come in this position differently. I ran for an empty seat and it made it easier than running and challenging a person who was already in. Yes, but that's why there's term limits and only serving two terms, except for Kathy's sort of unique because you came in as a midterm, but you're, you're special in that way. But most people just, there are two terms and they're out. And, uh, and I support that. And uh, I know the mayor is a uh, four term because they're, you have to run every other year, which is a lot of running for office and all these guidelines that we're talking about, I'm gonna have to be especially diligent because I don't wanna violate any of these either and be on the front page of the newspaper in shame. So well, running for office carries so many burdens. I'm amazed that we get people to run for office uh, because you do one thing wrong and uh, there's a lot of trouble all over you. But I think it is time that we looked at some numbers, 55,000, I laughed when I signed that. There's no way. And I had an expensive campaign in my mind. I still have money left over. Um, it is time to retire your debt, Jack. And, and I hope that you can uh, get the, the money up and do that. You brought up one thing and I wanna ask Larissa, if you wouldn't mind commenting that when I first ran for office, I had no money. So I self-funded and probably many of you did the same. I self-funded on a loan format and then I paid myself back. If we look at a thousand dollar candidate donation would, I thought I heard you say earlier, so I want to make sure it's clear, would there be a $1,000 limit on that? Or could you fund however much you need to get your candidacy started and then pay yourself back? So what the courts have said is that there shouldn't be limits on what candidates can self-fund because that doesn't implicate the public concern about donors getting undue influence on public officials who get elected. But notwithstanding that, the state law has set, as I mentioned earlier, the $100,000 limit on a loan to your own candidacy and that you're not allowed to charge your own campaign committee interest on the loan you make. So there are still provisions in the law that allow for loans, that allow loans to be candidate, loans that candidates make to their committees to be repaid by funds that they collect. So. If we are still talking from what I've heard about voluntary campaign contribution limits, if this remains voluntary, you could, if you wanted to, discuss potentially having voluntary self-funding limits, but I think that's one of those concerns we would have about, because the courts have been so strongly stating that candidates who self-fund aren't the concern you have about the big money influence in politics, because that's not third parties with the perception that potentially that they are getting more favorable treatment. Excellent. So you can up to $100,000, you can give yourself a loan <laughs> and then pay yourself back. And then you could pay as, as much as you want to for your own campaign with the state, Correct. but we would still have these limits. So oh, I guess um, if there's a 15 and a 25 limit and I'm a multimillionaire, which I'm not, and I want to spend more than 25,000, I just wouldn't sign the campaign uh, cap, um, the campaign maximum limits. That could be an option if you wanted to sell fund for more than 25,000. All right, with that, any other comments before we stop? Seeing no hands. Um, Clerk, would you take a roll call vote, please? Certainly. Uh, Council members Arkin? Aye. Testa? Aye. Naram? No. Balch? No. Mayor Brown? Aye. The motion passes with Naram and Balch voting no. Hey, thank you. Um, we are on to. Um, Matters initiated by council. Does anybody have anything they want to initiate in the city council? Yes, Valerie. Sorry, Arkin. Um, I just have one thing, and I don't, you know, I, um, this kind of all has to do with our discussion on the housing element, um, public comment that we received on that, um, and, and the whole questions I had about the affordable housing fund and the balance and all that. And it, it kind of came up about the, um, I guess it's a nexus study um, regarding the affordable housing fees. 
And since we're going into a housing element process, could that be something we look at to see if that does need to be modified? So uh, the question, you're asking a question, can we, can we look at uh, revising the Nexus study? The answer, yes, uh, it, that is yes. It, it's a, it's a, an involved, lengthy technical analysis that uh, we would have to um, spend some money on uh, with new assumptions re related to growth and employment figures. Um, um, so we can fold that into uh, or make it run parallel to the housing element process. Um, and we can add it to your council priority work plan and, and bring those two processes and efforts together eventually in the future. That's not a discussion I can turn around in a month or two um, or even six months. It's gonna take some time. But if the objective is to have that policy discussion, can we lift the fees what are the conditions? What are the assumptions that go into that methodology and have that be part of the housing element process? Uh, certainly. And, um, and if you wanna do that, I would add it to your council priority work plan and we would bring that forward at that time and, and you all can collectively decide whether that's a priority. Can I just put up just one point of clarification. So under recent case law from the city of San Jose, Affordable housing fees technically do not need nexus studies. Uh, that being said, they're they're treated by the courts as more of a zoning requirement than as a as a nexus uh, requirement. That being said, a lot of cities, even though that's the case, do nexus studies to show how reasonable they are and to get a, a grasp on on what the appropriate amount is. And that's what we've done in the past. So I just want to make clear that. Legally, a nexus study may not re be required. I think it's a good idea to have one, and we've always done that, but I just wanted to clarify that, that legal point. Yeah, Dan, that's, that's, that's a good legal point. I think from a policy perspective, you want to be able to demonstrate the reason why those numbers get adopted uh, from, absolutely. from a policy perspective. Absolutely. absolutely. Study absolutely. is is critical. Right. Okay, so I think putting it on the um, work plan is probably the better direction to go then. I would recommend you do that. Okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're shooting to have a workshop in April. Yeah, okay, thank you. Council Member Naren? Yeah, so I just, I have a, probably a stupid question along these lines, but we just did the Nexus study a couple of years ago and my recollection was the amount that we chose was quite a bit less than what we could have picked. Why can't we just dust that off and take a look at those numbers as part of, you know, in the work plan uh, and see if that makes sense versus, you know, having one more task to do and spending more money. And we could probably achieve what we want, have that justification, but in a lot simpler way. Yeah, I mean, it's it was more than a couple of years ago. Was uh, it? But, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, time um, flies when you're having fun. <laughs> uh, and that could be an option. Uh, we we input you know all the updated numbers to spit out you know what the what the new calculations are without spending a lot of money, time, or resources on it. But sitting here today, I, I couldn't answer that for you definitively. But if it gets added to the work plan, we'll do that exercise um, and come back with a recommendation. Question. Council Member Bond? Yeah, I would actually like to have council bring back uh, a report on the campaign disclosure and reporting compliance on the form 460s showing us from the 2020 election. I don't know if that's a council item. Well, I would like staff to put a report together of those compliant and non-compliant in the interest of transparency. If we have three votes, anybody want to I, support that? I support that. There were a lot of issues on the disclosures and, and not all of them were filed. 
on time either. So I think. Can, sorry, Council Member Darm. I, I would like it to then look at potential penalties or other things for non-compliance. I think disclosure and transparency are critical. So it may be even a potential ordinance out of that. You guys are getting really petty and punitive here. Um, if you have an issue with the candidate, why don't you just tell the candidate they made a mistake, let them fix it. And it could be a candidate that didn't get elected. Right, so I think you just had two votes on that one. Sorry. I, can I can I just ask something on that? I mean, if anybody does anything incorrect on their 460, isn't there a penalty with the FPPC? Or I mean, there's we have deadlines. We had to file things. Is there? I, I'm kind of I'm, I'm kind of lost here because I want I really I truly want to understand. I'm all about transparency, um, but I want to understand why we would get involved with trying to if I understand correctly, find each other, if um, there was something somebody forgot or they didn't cross a T or dot an I, or I, I just, and I'm being sincere, um, explain what you, why you think we should get involved because I think there is an avenue legally that, you know, we have a lot of rules to follow as we all had that handbook and had to, you know, watch the dates and what we had to file and, and things we had to account for. So. Maybe if you could explain a little more, because I do want to understand. So it's my understanding that the FPC does not. It actually falls on our city clerk. So uh, knowing where we're at and how to increase transparency through quality disclosure is what I'm saying. It doesn't have to lead to the ordinance for penalization. But I think what our goal is, is increase transparency, right? Timely, accurate filings to protect elections. But wouldn't of our wouldn't our city clerk have then notified us? And or are you saying she's not doing her job? Well, I'd like to have her go ahead and take a second look. I just I I whoever's respond if it's FPPC, they're responsible for some things. I know that. But well, if the city clerk, why is doesn't the staff tell us? Maybe we need staff to tell us who's responsible for monitoring four hundred and sixty compliance. Okay. Well, I, I would assume our, I, you know, I put trust in our city clerk that she would have notified us if anything was not in order. Um, she was actually, I'll just give, I give her a lot of credit because I think she, she was on top of everything with my campaign. I mean, she notified me on lots of reminders on when things were due. So I, I don't have any doubt in my mind that something was incorrect or, um, I don't know, but maybe this is better to be an offline conversation first with the city. I, 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 I'm going to weigh in here. You know, if this was genuine concern, it would be offline. It's being done on camera out of malice. So, and and really? if if I misstated what I spent on my, I, I I can't. I'll have to go back. I'm not as that you can look everything up during a council meeting. I'll have to look that up. I haven't looked at it in two years, but. Um, I think there's a, you know, an intention of malice here, which is really unfortunate. It's an intention of transparency. If you would like to miss, no, it would be done off my off intent, camera. If it you was can. you just, just get a vote yes or no to support the item brought up by a council member. So it sounds like I don't have the votes. I have the votes, and I hope if you find something that's not right, please point it out directly to the candidate or the council member or the mayor. Um, so that is matters initiated. Does anybody have something else to raise for matters initiated? Seeing none. All right. Did anybody go to any really interesting meetings, the council reports? Yes, Council Member Naram. So I've been busy. Uh, we had an iGate board meeting, and the the thrust of the board meeting is of the board meeting is that iGate is pivoting. And they are now going to focus on life sciences. And uh, they're going to be moving into uh, likely a new building with lab space, you know, that would be appropriate for life sciences. But what I think is really important or, or significant is that uh, iGate will be par partnering with Tri Valley Ventures, which is a, a capital fund run by, I think I'll get his name right, Greg Hitchens, 
who used to have, what was it, Innovate Pleasanton. Uh, he had an incubator across from Hart uh, a few years ago that he shut down and now he's doing this Tri-Valley Ventures. He and his group will be screening and uh, iGate will be providing space. And the cities of Danville, Dublin and Pleasanton, our contributions will be used, are going to be used to roll out for lack of a better word, a PR campaign promoting this uh, uh, about come, you know, take your idea and, and you know, make it real here and, and all the reasons why this is a great place, the Tri-Valley is a great place to do this. Let's look for that. Um, I think it's pretty exciting actually. Um, as I said, it took them 10 years to figure out that mission, but um, I, I really think it's in the right direction. I also think it's a benefit to us. So that was one thing. Uh, I went to an EBCE board retreat where they reviewed in depth the local um, projects and things that they're doing. And so actually, I mean, these people are like, <laughs> it's kind of really fun because they're so enthusiastic, but you're going to see things about induction cooking uh, as a way to uh, help with climate action. Um, or with, with climate action plans. Um, you're gonna see grants for um, electric vehicle chargers and so forth. Anyway, I won't get into all the details of that. And then I also went to uh, a Valley Link board meeting and Valley Link, they are continuing to, to just push forward. Uh, we adopted, spent two hours adopting policies that uh, are necessary for Valley Link to be able to apply for federal transportation funding. Um, so I think that's really exciting. Uh, the EIR is on track for May certification, possibly April, but, but more likely in May, which will be another huge milestone uh, for Valley Link. So um, I think it's all exciting, good things. And that's it for me. Really excited about the eye gate. That's to go biotech. I mean, it's, we are in such a rich biotech R&D facility region, so. Really exciting. Uh, Council Member Balch, did you have your hand raised also? Yes, please, Mayor, thank you. Uh, so I just have uh, three things. Uh, Innovation Tri-Valley met, and normally I wouldn't necessarily uh, pull it up, but uh, they had Sunny Wright McPeak on, and I think I'm saying her name correctly, and I apologize if I'm not, from uh, California Emergency Technology Fund, and it's uh, broadband to all. And uh, hearing her speak, uh, I have something to aspire to because this uh, woman was articulate and knew her information. And uh, we're just blessed in California to have her working as hard as we uh, are benefiting from her hard work um, for broadband. And uh, I look forward to carrying a lot of her message on to the Economic Vitality Committee on Thursday. Um, my second thing I wanted to just acknowledge today when we just passed at item 11, the equal pay day, I uh, mentioned it briefly just in the moment, but I definitely want to um, uh, put forth how important that is. Uh, and I, I appreciate uh, us putting a spotlight on it. So um, personally, and, and, and my wife works and, and equality should be important. Uh, then lastly, I wanted to just uh, start by saying that we're at the approximate anniversary of the shelter in place order a year ago. And so uh, I wanted to just express in looking back, and I, I'm sure many of us have, my sincerest thanks to the prior council and our city staff and leadership team for their dedication to the community uh, during the pandemic. And as we continue forth, uh, you know, city staff did a lot of things to help brace our community, communication, decisiveness, agility, innovation, courage um, in the face of amazing challenges. And uh, they've done so with professionalism and dedication as they've been rotating through different departments and buildings. Um, so as an elected official in this community, I just wanted to say it's not gone unnoticed nor unappreciated. I appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate the honorable work you do for us every day. So thank you very much. On behalf of the three of us that were on the Farmer Council, you're welcome.
<laughs> Actually, you're still serving with three people. Oh, uh, Council Member Arkin, do you have any council reports? Um, just a couple of things. Um, let's see. Uh, I attended the wonderful State of the City address with our uh, Mayor Brown. It did a fabulous job. So that was wonderful. Um, I did go to the, um, I did attend this, um, the city and PUSD liaison uh, meeting and a couple things on that. Uh, uh, our school district did talk about all the reopening plans. So kids are back in school on kind of a hybrid model, but they are all back now, all levels of school. So that's good. And also Youth and Government Day is on March 30th from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. I believe that's gonna be a virtual type of thing. And I believe their um, city manager Fialo can correct me if I'm wrong. I think that uh, we can all have some, we can log on to watch or some sort of thing and be involved in some way. Of course, so we'll get that information that's, out to everybody. Yeah, that, that's always an exciting event. So um, um, that's March 30th, 1 to 2.30. And let me see, uh, Supervisor Miley, um, I think, most of you had all been on that as well. His, Supervisor Miley had a pleasant community meeting, joined in on that. And um, also our, um, our, uh, our law enforcement department did um, do a homeless outreach uh, session with me that I logged on to. And I was very appreciative of the work they're doing in that area and look forward to hearing more updates on that, on how we address um, our vulnerable populations and how we do get them resources and try to help in any way we can. So that was good. Um, and that's all I have. Busy as well, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Testa. Okay, well, I'm gonna repeat a few because we were all at some of the same ones, but um, certainly enjoyed the State of the City address. Good job, Mayor Brown. Um, I was also at the supervisor, Nate Miley um, town hall. And um, I, uh, Alameda County mosquito abatement meeting. I attended several community meetings that I won't itemize because there's quite a few of them. Um, but I will, oh, and uh, let's see, um, our, uh, legislative committee. That one was a, a really good one with a, a lot of um, um, district representatives and and uh, the League of California Cities representative was there. That was a, a good meeting. But the one I enjoyed the most was definitely the, I also got a presentation from um, PPD on our homeless outreach team. And um, it made me, I, there was a, a lot that I wasn't aware of that I'm glad to now have information to share with community members about some of the really great work that the officers of the homeless outreach team are doing. So um, that's, I'll wrap up with that. Thanks. Well, I want to see that homeless outreach. That sounds like a really good event. It's, it'll um, make it'll make you feel good about what we're doing in Pleasanton. Good. We've we've got more to do, like but it. we're we're doing a lot. Well, I had the EBCE. Um, he's a CEO with me over at the mayor's uh, report on TV thirty the other day. Great. Answered lots of questions for people looking to figure out how the whole process works and what their options are. Um, on Monday, the city manager and I met with the mayor and city manager from Livermore to start talking about airplanes, data collection, and so much more. So we're getting that discussion started and I know everybody's interested because we're all getting all these emails. And um, I also attended the Alameda County Mayor's Conference and I helped pick the topic and the speaker this time and it was on youth at risk of um, whether it's through COVID and they're not being able to have somebody see them because you're not going to school or to a preschool um, and just uh, some of the resources that are available to families to make sure that children are safe and that each other family members are safe. And uh, 
yeah, I'm looking forward to speaking at the um, Youth in Government Day. Um, so looking forward to that. And with that, I think we're all covered. Uh, I would like to adjourn this meeting. Council Member Arkin, do you have closing remarks? I do, thank you, Mayor Brown. The Pleasanton City Council adjourns our meeting with a tribute to our nation's men and women serving in the military. We wish to honor the memories of those who have died in the past wars in defense of our country, including those who have died in the current conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. And also I'd like to add my own little bit here. Um, I'd like to add that March is Women's History Month and Women's History Month celebrates the contributions of women to events in history and contemporary society. And there's a lot of notable women in our military, but I'd like to highlight one, Army Sergeant Leanne Hester. She became the first of two women to earn a silver star since World War II while in, in fighting direct combat in Iraq in 2005. So with that, I adjourn our meeting. Thank you. And hopefully she got equal pay. All right.